Let's go. Good uh, evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode, a live episode, as they are for this podcast of Ferret Cafe. I am your host, Yummy the Ferret. Sit back, relax, grab a cup of Joe. And enjoy some conversation uh, for today, for today's episode. Uh, I've been I've been inclined to get the uh, sheets hot chocolate that has the s'mores mixed into it. It's usually really good. Today uh, they uh, I think they put I, I don't I don't know I don't think they put the s'mores into it. I think they accidentally put dark chocolate, and I'm not a fan of dark chocolate, um, but. It's still, like, the s'mores, sheets, hot chocolate is still one of my favorites. I still won't put tots inside my burrito, but goddamn, I will I will sip upon the almighty s'mores hot cocoa uh, any day that it's kind of cold out. You know what I'm saying? I hope everyone's doing fantastic today. Uh, we got a nice schedule of stuff to talk about today. We're going to start off with the What If Season 2, uh, kind of like a wrap-up or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm just going to talk about my thoughts on it compared to the first season. And um, I don't think I'm going to like rank the episode. Well, maybe I will eventually. I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Uh, then after that, um, Callus is supposed to be joining me for the Deftones, Definitive Deftones album ranking uh, kind of like with Blink-182, I did all the research, uh, and I listened to all the albums multiple times this time around, uh, because Deftones are still one of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, probably, I mean, probably, like, after this re-listen, I probably, probably, like, my number two, <laughs> maybe even stretching into number one <laughs> with how good their albums are, but, uh, we'll talk about that later. And then also we have playoff predictions for the NFL, the National Football League. We're talking Browns, we're talking Texans, we're talking Chiefs, we're talking anyone else in the mix. We're going to go over our predictions for the NFL playoffs. Who will win the Super Bowl? Uh, don't bet money on anything I say, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, but to start off, I hope everyone in the chat is doing well. Uh, we got Coco here, along with Greedy Waffles. Hello there. General Obi-Wan Kenobi and Callus so far. Uh, we're going to... We're going we're gonna to get started here. We're going to get started here. Um, if you did not already, um, the Top 10 Games Contest and the Game of the Year stuff is officially over. It's over. Do not edit your lists. I warn you. <laughs> I do not edit your lists. I have saved everyone's list as uh, for the current configuration, and you cannot edit your list anymore. Okay, um, that is it. You are, we are done, and uh, the top ten games will come out the um, Saturday, the day, uh, the two days after this recording. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, uh, good luck, you know, good luck. Uh, I tried to give as many hints as I could this year. And by golly, it doesn't seem like many people uh, picked up on them. <laughs> because as of right now, I'm doing this right now live. I'm going to set the top 10 games video to a premiere, which should make it show up in people's feeds. And it will also show the thumbnail. Boom. Bada bing. Uh, 10.30? 10.30. All right. There you go. And uh, there might be some games on that thumbnail that you uh, might not have thought of. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to help you in Elden Ring while we're doing this podcast. Uh, but the end game is the actual the true end game is back at the Capitol. So. Um, make your way back there. That is the only... That, no more Elden Ring. <laughs> I'm not even allowed... I'm not even supposed to be helping you anymore. Alright, let's get started with uh, Marvel's What If. Now, What If is an interesting Marvel concept where they take these stories 
that um, they take like the regular Marvel stories from the MCU. Not really, not, not like, I, well, I guess kind of some of them are taken from comic book stuff, but uh, they kind of take these stories that you know from like the movies and the TV shows and stuff like that, and they twist it by either taking a character and putting them into a different situation, take removing a character entirely, uh, killing off characters, etc. And season one, although I still have my gripes about it, was a decent enough season. Uh, with a pretty good conclusion. Um, essentially, it starts up and it's just kind of like this wacky and wild thing where it's like, oh, what if, what if the Avengers all died? What if they all got killed before they could avenge or before they could assemble, right? And then there was another one where it's like, well, what if, what if T'Challa was the one who was abducted by the, um, by the, uh, the, the, you know, abducted instead of Peter Quill, you know, like there was cool stuff like that. What if, what if Killmonger rescued T Tony Stark? That that was that was one of my favorites from last season. And of course, there was like, what if zombies, which was based off of a manga that came out uh, where all the um, the Ravagers, thank you, Coco, where all the uh, the heroes, most of them, turned zombified, and there was so many like interesting experimental episodes right um and it's one of those things where it's like uh, I, I i really enjoyed most of the episodes but there were still some stinkers in there some like kind of relatively vanilla episodes and one of the characters who i thought had a very vanilla episode was captain carter you know what if cat what if what if captain carter uh, what if what if <laughs> peggy carter uh got the super serum instead of you know, the actual Captain America. And I thought, like, yeah, it's a cool concept, but the episode is really boring. And <laughs> um, I'm not going to say unfortunately, but there's a part of me that goes, wow, we could, we might have had too much Peggy Carter in this season, uh, for me personally. Uh, because her stories are never... Maybe, I won't say never, but her stories, especially for What If, aren't exactly enthralling. Um... Episode, uh, episode five. Hold on, let me look at my notes. Yeah, episode five is the first one that truly features Captain Carter, and it's pretty much just a nothing episode where she goes up against Steve Rogers, who is inside of the Hydra Stomper, uh, because in the first season he acquires, you know, he gets into this, uh, uh, he gets into the suit to help Peggy Carter, and it's, I mean, it's fine. You know, but essentially, uh, he, uh, he gets like brainwashed or something and now he's sort of kind of evil, <laughs> I guess. Um, and he, and, and Peggy Carter teams up with, uh, Black Widow who, uh, takes her to like some remote base that has like a bunch of mannequins and the other Black Widow sisters come down and they have like a, this big fight and then, of course, Steve, Steve Rogers ends up uh, sacrificing himself in the, in the end. And it was really just a big nothing episode. It, it really was. Like, really nothing of... I mean, if they, if they had taken this episode out of the list of episodes, like, nothing would have changed in the timeline, especially for Peggy Carter, Captain Carter. Um, it was just one of the... It was, it was a very uninteresting episode. And... I think I think a lot of these what if season two episodes, they they really speed through the plot to get to the big action scenes. And I know a lot of people are like, well, duh, the action is the best part. Not necessarily. I liked season one because the story and the action went hand in hand. In season two, it was a lot of action for most of these episodes. And whenever there was any story business going on, it almost seemed like they were playing it at two speed, like two times speed, if you get what I'm saying. Like the characters were like talking so fast and they it was all like kind of gibberish at times. And there were moments where like something plot heavy would happen and it would just it would just immediately like in a snap go past it and it's one of those things that really like that was really shown in in the fifth episode and in the fourth episode if i'm being honest um but yeah this fifth episode was like 
I mean, it was fine, but it was super uninteresting, and it really didn't do much for me personally, and I'm, pro I'm sure it didn't do much for everyone else. The only thing that I kind of caught a wink at, at uh, throughout this episode is they're kind of building a relationship between Carter and Black Widow, which I don't mind at all. I feel like the <laughs> there is a bit of, like, I don't know, not sexual tension, but just kind of like... Like, will they, won't they kind of tension, I guess you could say. Uh, but they keep throwing Steve Rogers back in this shit. And it's like, well, hold on. Like, you you were, like, building a relationship between these two characters for most of this episode. And, and, and all of a sudden, you throw Steve Rogers back in here. And it's like, oh, well, okay. And then at the end of the episode, they do it again. They, they literally do it again where they're, like, talking. And it's, like, very, like, will they, won't they, you know? And, and yeah. And then she gets sucked into a portal. And that's the end of it all. Um... Which is like, okay, whatever, you know. Alright, we got the most inter uninteresting episode out of the way. Let's go back to the beginning. So, episode one, uh, Nebula joins the Nova Corps. This was the... F uh, this, is, this obviously was the first episode in the season. And, um... It had, like, a detective kind of, you know, kind of vibe to it. Very kind of Blade Runner-esque, I guess you could say. Um, the one thing that I didn't understand about this episode was this weird team-up that Nebula has with Howard the Duck, Korg, and Groot. It's a weird collection of characters who don't really make sense to be on the planet, um, in, if, if we are to ascertain where this episode is taking place in the grander scheme of the MCU, I feel like... Neither Korg nor Groot should be here. Howard the Duck all honestly doesn't make sense either because he would be a part of the collector's collection at this time. But we we kind of throw that kind of stuff out for these what if episodes because you know there's a lot like you know one small change, one thread of uh, one one butterfly being killed by a by a by someone stepping on it can make a whole chain reaction down the road in the timeline of things so i don't put a lot into that but i just i just thought it was kind of interesting because they usually try to slot characters in who are appropriate for the episode and even though i like korg and groot and of course howard the duck was pretty good in this too um it just kind of seemed a little bit weird because they always try to stick to you know trying to remember where these characters are in the grander scheme of things um, I thought that this episode was mostly okay. It had some dull moments in it for sure. Uh, but, uh, it, I mean, like for a, like a Blade Runner inspired kind of episode, it wasn't half bad. It was just kind of, there were times when it kind of really dragged and, and, uh, there was some real BS deu, deus ex machina through, throughout this. Um, and then the ending was also kind of lame too, how, um... Nova Prime just kind of fell and you don't really see her die and I guess that's kind of an obligatory ending that they kind of want to have because it's like oh did she die or did she not die I guess we'll never know also like how they deal with Ronin like they just kind of closed like the whole plot of the episode is like they the Nova Corps close this planet in a shield to keep out Ronin and essentially the Nova Prime who originally closed the fucking shield is like oh we gotta open it back up we made a deal so they start opening it back up, and then Nebula's like, ah, 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 <laughs> you didn't say the, the magic word. And she closes the gate on Ronin's ship, making it blow up. And I was just thinking that whole time, like, okay, Ronin, just go a little bit faster, maybe? Like, maybe put the gas on a little bit more? Or even reverse it, really? <laughs> you know? You have a fucking Infinity Stone in your hammer. I believe they showed it in this episode. Just fucking, like, do something. I don't know, but instead he's just like slowly moves his ship through the shield and it's closing at the last second he's like oh and then he gets blown up into a million pieces i don't know i, f I feel like the writing was kind of weak on this one all around but at least it was a fun concept i guess you could say uh but uh yeah whatever the next episode was Episode 2, of course, Peter Quill Attacks Earth's Mightiest Heroes. And this, I really thought, was a great episode. Uh, the first episode was like, eh, you know, kind of uh, teetering on the line of just kind of being genuinely okay. Uh, but uh, Peter Quill Attacks my, my Earth's Mightiest Heroes kind of goes the way that you kind of expect it to, where Peter actually gets pick, picked up by Ego, and uh, the Ra or I'm sorry, the Ravagers actually take 
Peter Quill to Ego, and uh, he trains Peter to be like his um, his uh, his minion, essentially. I think it's a really interesting premise, and I think the Avengers-esque team up during the Cold War was also really really cool. Uh, the one thing that this that this episode was truly missing was a big death or something, and that's a trend that you will hear me talk about throughout the entire the entirety of this segment of the podcast. Um, no one dies in like any of these episodes. I, I like it's very, very strange. Like there's only a couple deaths sprinkled throughout and compare that to the first season where like everyone was dying. Uh, it's kind of weird because like, I think that's when, 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 what if is strongest is when they're actually doing cool things like that, where they're like, Oh, what if we just kill off Iron Man here? Oh, what if we just, you know? We just have Scarlet Witch be a, a zombie. Like, that's the cool stuff, right? Uh, they don't really do that this season. There's not really that cool, like, oh, what if Thor did get killed by his sister or something? They didn't do that. They didn't They, they didn't go that deep. Uh, but this episode, even though they didn't do that, okay, I'm not going to complain about them not killing, uh, killing people, I guess. But I think the cool thing about the whole Cold War era setting is you get Peggy Carter as like a general or whatever, or kind of in the same role as Nick Fury. Uh, you get like all these different factions teaming up to go against uh, Peter Quill, who is attacking Earth and and uh, going to plant this seed that'll take over the planet for Ego. Um, I felt like the Winter Soldier inclusion was a good um, a good substitute for the the fish out of water kind of thing that that steve rogers has where it's like oh and you know it's 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 the winter soldier there and he's talking to um he's talking to this this old man <laughs> uh and i felt like the whole ending sequence where winter soldier is 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 planning on like sniping peter quill um i thought that was really intense and really well done and i thought the ending was also pretty fun too um, just a just a good all around episode, uh, but it was just lacking that one thing that I really was that I really wanted, which like you know just just give him a, just just have a character death in there, have something happen of consequence that that kind of impacts the story a little bit more. But for the most part, still a, a good ep a great episode. Uh, enjoyed it a lot. I, I think that um, I think that they need more episodes like this that are just weird, wacky out there, and with you know that that and also do premises that like. Are, are are understandable like yeah if, duh what you know what if peter quill had attacked earth because he was sent to ego i think that's a great idea episode three is was probably the most fun episode of what if season two uh, and that is the one called happy hogan saves christmas and this is definitely like we already had blade runner inspiration uh now for episode three which maybe is too soon after the blade runner inspired episode uh but still nevertheless it was a fun episode this one was heavily inspired by die hard uh very very heavily inspired by die hard happy hogan is throwing like a christmas party and essentially um him and he's well essentially he is supposed to get the avengers there to uh, have a holiday fun party uh but um Ju justin hammer comes in and you're like well who's who's this guy uh, i believe he was the dude from the second iron man movie right hammer um but yeah he he comes in he takes over all the uh, iron man robot suits and uh he takes over like the the hulk buster suit as well at the end um, but he's trying to find the hulk formula hulk's blood uh because he wants to use it to uh become like a villain uh but happy hogan in his stumbling and bumbling accidentally injects himself with the hulk formula turning him into purple hulk which is the first time that we're seeing purple hulk in this mcu universe um i felt like this 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 episode was funny um, not only in like the gags that they did and the references to Die Hard, but also just in like the premise in general. Like you have you have her Earth's Mightiest Heroes like ignoring Happy Hogan um, while he's while things are happening. And I think the funniest part is when he's talking to um, the girl on the phone and he's like changing into 
uh, Purple Hulk for the first time. It's a, it's just a very fun moment. It's a very it's a very it's a very fun episode, and um, I think that throughout the whole thing, it's just a very fun episode. I think they did a really great job with it. Um, and the Purple Hulk thing is really good for this episode. It's just really kind of weird that they brought it back for the medieval episode in a couple in a couple episodes that I'll talk about. Um, just because it's like I felt like this was a pretty unique story with the Purple Hulk. I don't think we really needed Happy Hogan to have the Purple Hulk power in a later episode in a completely different universe in a medieval times. I don't know if it really exactly makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess not a lot of things make sense in that medieval episode, but we'll get to that eventually. Uh, but, but for right now, uh, Happy Hogan Saves Christmas is probably either my number one or number two episode. It was just a very fun time. It was a dumb premise. It was like a. It was very closely related to Die Hard. It was a Christmas episode, and um, yeah, I didn't. I don't. I didn't have any problems with it. I thought it was a great, a great time. Maybe not as grandiose as maybe I was hoping, but uh, still. You got to have some of the smaller episodes with the bigger episodes. Episode four. This one was the one that was supposed to apparently be in season one called Iron Man crashes into Grand Master. Um, essentially, instead of Hulk crashing on the planet uh, later um, after the events of like uh, Avengers 2, uh, Age of Ultron, uh, Iron Man, who is who saves the world uh, from Thanos for the in Avengers 1, uh, gets transported to the Grand Master's planet, um, and he's kind of like a legend there, I guess. Um, or maybe they make him think that he's a legend. Um, but essentially, the Grand Master um, uh, kind of ropes him into doing the Colosseum stuff. But instead of it being like a fight pit, which there is there is some fighting, don't get me wrong. It's a Mad Max-inspired racetrack kind of thing going on. Um, which, I like the idea of a race. I think that's pretty cool. The problem is, I've already talked about this before, the plot in this episode is almost non-existent for, for most of it. It's either really quick you know, quick conversations, or it's just plain action. And I do like the action, don't get me wrong. I just need a bit more substance to episodes like this that have so much action in them um but uh korg and valkyrie make a return in this episode and i thought they were both great side characters also of course gamora is in this episode um and she's like hunting tony stark and i think that's also another fun aspect to it like tony uh, uses the uh, kind of like suicide squad bomb in plantation but it's electrical uses it on her um which is was a pretty fun moment um and then they kind of everyone kind of teams up at the end to take down grand master um i just like i think the episode's fine in general i think it's just way too much action in this one it's mostly just the race which i guess people would say like yeah of course we want the race but i was really hoping for some more story in here like I, I was really hoping for for more. Um, not saying that it's the worst episode. I'm just saying it's kind of like a middling episode. It's kind of like, oh, it's good, but I wish there was just something more going on. And then my final gripe is like, it really feels like the Gamora link to season one where she has the Infinity Stones is a very weak link. Essentially, there's a quick like five to six second ending shot of Iron Man and Gamora taking down Thanos it's it's they don't even show it actually it's just they just show Gamora jumping and into action and I just thought like Gamora in season one the final episode it was random and strange that she was there when she wasn't introduced and this episode really still doesn't really introduce the same character that we that we've seen in that season one finale it's just a very weak tie-in you almost wonder if it actually wasn't supposed to be in season one and they were like well we said there was a missing episode so i guess we gotta throw it onto the end of of this iron man episode i don't know it's just kind of weird like i understand gamora you know hunting down tony stark and them teaming up and taking out thanos i get it but wouldn't it have been an, a more interesting story to either have another episode after this one where Gamora finds the Infinity Stones and we see how she controls them instead of it just being like, ah, eh, she takes out Thanos and in the next time you see her in season one, uh, she has all the stones. I don't know, just kind of weak writing in my opinion. Oh, but we're moving on, folks. We already talked about episode five uh, for Captain Carter. Uh, let's talk about episode six, Kahori Reshapes the World. And um, this is actually, this actually is probably my favorite episode, even though I didn't like the 
the, the, the final scene. Um, I think that this is like the best that What If has to offer. A truly unique perspective, a truly unique episode that dives into more than just MCU stuff. I mean, this is Native Americans, I believe, versus the Spanish conquistadors. Um, essentially, Queen... Uh, not Queen Elizabeth. Um, Queen Isabella. Isabella uh, sends over conquistadors from Spain to take to to capture foreign lands, essentially, um, and and whatever. And so and so, Kahori and her native family uh, is kind of thrust into the middle of this of this crazy sacking of their land, essentially. And there's like this pool uh, in a cave that's like cursed, but Kahori falls into it and gets transported to another dimension, essentially. Um, and I, I believe it's the Tesseract, right? The Tesseract does this. Um, so all the natives who went into that pool got and, and, and fought over that pool got transported to this world. And now they're living in like this harmony uh, where they have like these superpowers and they can run really fast and they can make light out of their hands and, and all that stuff. And uh, I think that one, thank you for bringing this up. Suter broke the pieces, broke the Tesseract into pieces. Um, I think that's a great opening for this where Suter takes down... Um, you know, Odin and that such, uh, you know, but earlier than he does in the MCU. But yeah, it's just one of those episodes that was just genuinely visually stimulating. And it was also genuinely really well written. Um, there's not, there's not a lot of episodes in this season that I would say are really, really well written. And this is one of those episodes that's just like, so, so good. I mean, from from the native language that they're speaking being pretty authentic, if I'm to be assured, um, to the weaponry that the uh, the conquistadors were using and their armor and stuff like that, it was all very authentic. And I just I really thought that this episode had a, it was a great episode. It was a strong episode. It was also a well paced episode. Like it wasn't just action full on. Like there's a build up of a story. Um, and I think that's because of Kahori. They had to set up this new character in the in the what if timeline in the MCU in general. And I think they and and because they had to do that, the story had a much better pacing to it. It felt like a mini movie almost where you go through the character's arc of you know finding this new land and trying to escape and then kind of getting settled in but also remember you know being reminded like oh god i need to go back and save my brother um and then eventually going back to the real world and, and getting the rest of her ancestors who have been trapped in the tesseract uh the, to leave with her in the end and then do this big action scene where they're sinking man of wars left and right and cannonballs are being shot back at ships and and stuff like that. it was just a really cool um, cool episode and in the end I thought the ending was going to be really strong because Kahori goes to Spain and she's talking to Queen Isabel B Isabella Isabel and she's like submit or or whatever and then Kahori like just takes up her throne and just smashes it I thought that would, that would have just been a great ending in general if they just ended it right there <sighs> but instead of doing that they have Doctor Strange um supreme strange whatever he's called the evil version of dr strange essentially who showed up in season one and he was also a big part of the finale for season one uh shows up and he's like hey i need to talk to you or whatever and i just thought that that was just a really just like we could have left this out we really could have left this out like they could have just introduced uh, strange supreme double supreme <laughs> in episode eight which i'll talk about in a little bit um, they could have just done that, and it would have been understandable that he would have captured uh, Kahori or done whatever with Kahori, right? Uh, but instead, they introduce him in season si in episode six. And I know what you're about to say. Well, Yami, you complain that the the setup for the finale for season one really wasn't that strong. Um, and yes, I do I do think that the setup for the season one finale was not strong, but it still at least made sense at the end of it all. The setup for Strange Supreme, Double Supreme, Crunchwrap Supreme is just so flubbed. It really is. Like, instead of, like, doing a whole episode inspired by that version of Doctor Strange, like, they could have they could have done something different. I, I, know, I understand that he's kind of trapped in his, in his, like, dying dimension, right? 
Um, but we could have done something earlier on where it's like, oh, and this is what Strange is doing. Uh-oh. And then we see him come back in Kahori's episode, and maybe that would have been like, uh-oh, what's he doing? What's he cooking? Um, but instead, they introduce him in Kahori's episode, and it's like, fuck me, that's such a bad ending. Still, though, I think it's a very strong episode. I think it's, uh, minus the, uh, like, five seconds at the end, I think it's a very strong episode, and probably my favorite, um, right next to the Happy Hogan episode, and episode seven, which is probably, I would say episode seven is either, I mean, it's a real, it's a, it's either two or three, honestly. Um, but episode seven is if Hela found the seven rings. Now, Hela, uh, who, if you don't know, is Odin's daughter of death. Uh, she has this crown that she wears, kind of like Thor's hammer, where it's like attuned to her and, and whatever. She's the only one who can pick it up and all that stuff. And, um... It's just one of those things that's like, yeah, this is a great premise. You throw Hela into this, like, feudal medieval China, and she works with, or, well, she gets found by Zhu Wenyu, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, who has the Ten Rings. And she tries, you know, because she's still Hela, she's still the goddess of death in her mind at that part, at that point, uh, she tries and takes him from him. It's a pretty humorous scene where she knocks him out and tries to pull the, the rings off of him, but they won't budge. Um, I also forgot to mention that kind of like with like like Odin did the Thor's hammer making it, you know, not being able to wield until he, you know, became smarter or became the person that he was with that a better person. Uh, Odin kind of does the same thing with Hela's. Um, thank you, Xbox, for that lovely notification with her crown, uh, which call, which which is what she uses to have like swords pop out of nowhere, kind of like uh Aries from Wonder Woman. But anyway, so essentially she goes through this whole character arc kind of similar to Shang... Shang not Shang Tsung. Um, the Ten Rings movie that came out. Um, and essentially she goes through like, this whole thing with those people. She learns how to like airbend essentially. Um, and she learns like fighting and, and, and meditation and all that stuff. And in the end, uh, Odin actually comes to Earth to take the rings of power uh, from Zhu. Uh, so essentially, um, Hela teams up with the people of the um, uh, of, of the Airbending tribe, and she helps protect Earth from her father. And and of course, in doing so, um, she was able to pick up her crown because now she was a different, a changed person, and use it to defeat Odin. And I thought that that was a really great ending. Um, I think that uh, it had a great stinger at the end, and I think that in general, it's just one of those things that was like, "Yep, that was a great episode." They they really, they really did a great job with that. Um, and I, I th also thought like the acting was great. Uh, obviously, they bring back all the original people for their roles in this show which is another thing that i'd like to kind of do a side discussion on because people were cons like people were speculating because oh scarlet which isn't dead she's gonna be back because she has a five-year contract steve rogers isn't dead he's gonna be back because he has a six-year contract i'm pretty sure those contracts were for voicing their characters in this show and if that is true then that wipes the slate for my my concerns about the mcu going forward not being able to evolve um, but since they, they got those contracts simply to voice their characters in, in the, in the what if episodes, that's not a bad thing at all. I actually don't mind that. Anyway, let's move on to episode eight, which I had the least to talk about. Uh, this is the Avengers assembling in 1602. Um, essentially Captain Carter is, uh, pulled out of her timeline, out of her dimension, um, and pulled into 1602, medieval 1602, um, and uh, she is she's trying to help uh, Thor and Hela and the rest of the group of Avengers um, uh, stop the end of their dimension. Essentially, their world is falling apart because there's like an anomaly in there. Uh, so um, once again, this is another one that's kind of like not a lot of not a lot of plot, a lot of action, <laughs> you know. Um, I thought the ending was like kind of meh along with the rest of the plot was kind of meh. They, like it's cool to see the characters. Like it's a it's a cool premise, don't get me wrong. But I mean, when I think of medieval Avengers, I'm not thinking that they're going to have like the Iron Man gauntlet 
show up. I'm not thinking that they're going to have, like, I don't know, Happy Hogan turning into Purple Hulk and Hulk, you know, Bruce Banner turning into Hulk. Like, I, I, I think that they, they should have changed all these characters a bit more. Like, they have Ant-Man in there, and it's like, medieval Ma Ant-Man making himself go bigger and smaller... I don't know. I think they could have done more with this concept to make it more attuned to the time frame that they're showing. Like, Scarlet Witch having magic still makes sense. Odin having magic makes sense. Because back in medieval times, guess what? Even though magic wasn't real, it was still it's still one of those things that's like kinda kinda cool to think about. Like, you know, what what if magic was real? Poof, I now have I now have whatever. Um and that's the thing, right? Like, they, they sh could have done so much more with this premise. Like, instead of it being Ant-Man turning himself bigger and smaller, maybe we could have had, like, I don't know, any th any other Avenger that doesn't need to get big or small, right? Uh, you think about Hawkeye, and it's like Hawkeye is a perfect character to, like, center this story around because he's an archer. He's a skilled archer. Perfect. You could have Scarlet Witch and be in. I'm not not Scarlet Witch. Uh, Black Widow be here and have like crossbow, little mini crossbows. You know, like handheld crossbows. I think that would have been perfectly fine. You can still have Captain Carter in here, or even 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 you could even have Steve Rogers as Captain America kind of in here, uh, because they could they could find like the vibranium right and and forge a shield out of it. I think that's perfectly fine. I think that's perfectly sound. You can have like Iron the you know, Tony Stark be here and kind of be like his bumbling jester kind of self. Um but don't have the Iron Man suit like be made out of wood or whatever it was. Just kind of have like him be like the genius guy who who invents things. It doesn't have to necessarily be with electricity because during medieval times they didn't have electricity. So we could have had something different there, something something more unique, something better attuned to the time frame that they were cooking in for this episode. Um, same thing with like the Hulk turning into, you know, Bruce Banner turning the Hulk, Happy Hogan turning into Purple Hulk. Like we could have done something different. Like instead of, you know, Bruce Banner turning into like the Hulk that we know and love, well, maybe love, have him turn into like a hunchback kind of character or maybe more akin to uh, the older style of Hulk when it was just Andre the Giant, you know? I think that would have been so much better. Um, kind of the, on the opposite spectrum, you don't need to have Purple Hulk in here. We had the episode with Purple Hulk. It was a great episode. We don't need Purple Hulk in this episode. Just have Happy Hogan be a fucking security guy or a knight who is leading his troops. That's all you need him for. It doesn't... I mean, we don't, we don't need to have Happy Hogan turn into Purple Hulk. It's already happened in this season. We don't need it to happen again. It's not as cool, and especially not in this context. Um, so, yeah, there's so much more that I feel like they should have done with this... With this. Uh, premise in the end it's f it's fine i don't mind the episode i just think like they could have done so much more and i think that's kind of a running theme with most of these episodes like okay we could have got uh, something so much more with some of these premises and we could have gotten more episodes too honestly uh to kind of flesh out the doctor strange aspect in this but let let us get to the uh finale here because the finale i thought was quite dull was quite mundane and i thought it was also quite disappointing um, strange supreme cheese royale with cheese. Uh, what if strange? What if Su strange supreme intervened? Is the name of the story? Is the name of the episode? Um, but essentially, he is he is capturing all these world-ending, dimension-ending beings, whether they be good or bad, and sacrificing them to some sort of grand cosmic machine that is supposed to uh, recharge and bring his dimension back to life. Because he's so distraught about his then girlfriend dying, um, and I think the one main thing about this episode, once again, is there is just too much action, and it doesn't always make sense. We have character cameos kind of showing up here and there, like Peter Quill from episode two, and uh, and some other characters mixed in here. We have Kahori back, who is teaming up with Captain Carter, which is fine. I don't mind that at all. The problem is, it's just, it's, it's just action, 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 with no substance whatsoever. There is no substance. There is no, f there is no legs for this episode to stand on because it's just straight action there is nothing interesting truly going on i think this episode was mainly just made 
to for people to go, oh my god, look, it's an evil version of Captain America. Oh, Pog, dude. Oh my god. Like, but it's just a background character that they show for two seconds. And that's kind of the whole episode here, as we see two seconds of a cool concept character that could be in a future episode or even in a past episode. And, and essentially the whole point of this episode is to be like, oh my god, what if that did happen? Oh my god, is that Odin with black lightning? Dude, d uh, dude, that is so cool. Like, it's not cool. It's not cool because we don't know these characters. We don't know any of these characters. In the ending of season one, we had we had been on a journey with each of those characters, but minus Gamora, obviously. We had been on a journey with each of those characters. We knew their backstories. We knew where they were coming from. We knew why they were taking down Ultron because he was a threat to all multiverses, okay? Strange Supreme, st Strange Royale with Cheese, okay, shows up in one the end of two episodes essentially and then has a com a full episode of him just being straight up diabolical and evil right there's hardly any build up the the characters who are there to stop him peggy carter and kahori i do like i mean i don't mind i, I mean i don't mind captain carter and i think kahori is a great character but where are the other ones that were shown throughout these like episodes like why is peter quill's character just stuck behind a glass why isn't the Hela who gives up her crown in uh, before she gets sacrificed to the Great Machine, why isn't that the Hela that was in Episode 7? It's not that Hela! It's so bizarre to me that they, ha they, they build up some of these characters so much in their episodes, and then they don't even use them for the finale! <laughs> it's actually ridiculous! They could have totally had Hela team up with Kahori with Captain Garter! would have been fine they could have had peter quill there they could have released him from his little capture cube and re and and said hey we need your help dude maybe we could have um gamora with the infinity stones come back for this episode to really give her a full run around story for this but no she's just forgotten about there's so many things that are that is wrong with this finale and and and, and the thing that really irks me the most is that this episode is only being praised because oh my god did you see that one character who was on screen for 0.2 seconds dude oh my god like i get it it's interesting to see but that is that does not make a good episode okay we need something in there to bind this all together more than just action 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 when zombified scarlet witch showed up i rolled my fucking eyes because we did not get a full zombie episode and having scarlet witch zombified in this episode is just a slap in the face to everything that season one set up and did and season two is just like oh okay uh here's scarlet witch i hope you enjoy this reference to another episode i hope you enjoy this thing that was already established in a past episode in a different season i hope you enjoy that we didn't do any more story with this line maybe the next season sure maybe there is a season three coming around i'm sure there'll be many seasons after this because the one thing that i love about what if is that there are so many possibilities they can go crazy with this shit but season two they did the most bland shit at times they just did not think at all outside the box <laughs> I mean, there's several episodes that I've talked about that I've said were kind of mundane, not enough story, not enough going on. And I can't say that for episode, for season one, season one actually had stuff happening, it actually had characters dying that we know, that we love. You know, there's a whole episode where every single Avenger is like killed off and it's like, wow, that's kind of cool you know and they set up like the big ending where it's like well okay the avengers are gone and thanos takes over and destroys the world like that's kind of interesting but in this but in this season all wrapping up with this strange mega supreme battle just it's not that it's not good at all it's like it's, it's this is really my least favorite episode because there's just nothing of substance here it's just all action all reference nothing no story no plot significance no stakes at all like it's just like okay there we go it doesn't have a nice ending where the dimension is restored and but without dr strange sure i guess it's a bittersweet ending but in the end they could have done so much better with strange supreme one and also the ending of this season um i also want to say like the characters who show up kind of it did kind of remind me of the ending of mortal kombat one where it's just a bunch of like random you know characters from different 
uh, universes showing up and they're all like mixed together and and whatever and i thought that was really cool because it was like oh we're actually fighting these characters they're actually f kind of fleshed out almost you get you kind of understand their whole story just from looking at them um and i i don't think that i mean this was definitely in production before mortal kombat 1 came out of course but you know it kind of has it kind of has the opposite problem here for season two's finale where it's like you only stick a quick second of them you really can't tell exactly what they're all about. It'd be way more interesting to have a whole episode that shows some of these characters, and then we get that team up at the end where they all kind of come together, like bad and good, come together and just kind of do their thing. Also, really disappointing what they did with Killmonger. Like, I understand I understand why they did it for comedic effect, obviously, but we could have had a whole Killmonger thing here, too. Um, I thought that Killmonger's episode from Season 1 was one of the best. And essentially, there's, they just kind of take him out of the suit and throw him aside for this whole episode. I, I almost wonder if they just couldn't get the actor back for the voice's character. I don't know. Um, but that was another disappointing thing where it's like, yeah, of course, it's, it's for a gag. But also, like, we could have done more with this. And I think that's the main issue with season two in general is we could have done more with, with a lot of what was going on here. And I do think that there needed to be a couple more episodes just fleshing out, like, the whole underlying story for this season which was which was the strange supreme uh showdown at the end of it all and and even then like even even with all these characters that they introduced and all these different events that happened they still fumbled it in the end uh because they just didn't utilize the characters that they had been working on and working with for the entire season is it a bad season no i think it's fine it's definitely not as good as season one but there is some stuff in here to appreciate and be like oh that's that's pretty cool i like that um, but there is also, there is also like, I'm kind of half and half on this one where it's like, there's a whole nother side that's like way too action heavy, not enough story, not enough interesting ideas, n like three characters die in across the eight episodes or whatever. And it's like, we could have had more stakes here. We could have had more interesting premises, but instead we got what we got. And it's kind of like a half and half situation where it's like, okay, half of this is actually, you know, some really good episodes, probably be some episodes better than the first season altogether. Um, but then you have the other half of episodes where it's like, well, I would rather probably watch some of those seasons one episodes over most of these. Um, and I think the biggest letdown is just not having a zombies episode because a lot of season one episodes did end on a bit of a cliffhanger, especially that zombies episode. So it's like, why don't we continue with that you know over doing something like peggy carter versus the uh fucking hydra stomper like i please <laughs> i do like that they reference a lot of like uh pop culture in this one like they have episodes based around as i said already blade runner mad max and die hard i like that idea um, I'm just hoping that next season that they don't do as many of those reference episodes and they also really need to do some more, some even wackier and crazier things than even the first or second season combined. So that's that. Let me know how you felt about season two down below in the comments if you're listening to this YouTube or just right now in the chat. Um, cause over, cause all in all, it's, it's just a kind of a bit of like a meh season, right? I don't really have, I don't really have a rating, but yeah, I definitely, I definitely would put like the finale at the uh, at the lower tier, like the bottom. Uh, next up would be Captain Carter fighting the Hydra Stomper, the Avengers assembling in 1602, um, Iron Man crashing into the Grand Master, uh, and then after that, I would have uh, probably Peter Quill attacking Earth. No, no, Nebula joins the Nova Courts, and then Peter Quill attacks the Mightiest Heroes. And then I think I am going to put Happy Hogan, Hogan below Hela and Kahori at the end of it all. So there you go. Um, I think that was all of them. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so that is that, folks. We're going to move on to the next part of the show here, which is going to be the Deftones, definitive Deftones album ranking. Kind of like I did with Blink-182, I, I listened to all the albums and wrote down some some, some facts. I also wrote down all my favorite songs the, from, the, uh, from the albums. And uh, I also have my ranking at the end of it all. And I, I did put uh, tier list rankings as well, if that is what we are doing with this. Um, so, 
if Callus wants to join, I have the cafe waiting room, and then I will transfer you over to the gift tubing voice to talk to me. Also, I have something special here. I actually have a tier list set up here. I'm not actually I'm not going to activate it right now, um, but I do have a tier list in the background uh, to to mess around with after after all is said and done. Yeah. So um, we will be we should be good for that. Okay, let me move. Callus to gift tuning voice. Hello, Callus. Hello, Yemi. How are you doing? There we go. Ah, no tech issues. I love it. Nice. <laughs> uh, can everyone hear Callus okay? Uh, Callus, tell me how you're doing before I tell you how I'm doing. <laughs> well, thank you for asking. I'm doing pretty good. I'm feeling full right now. Ate some, uh, I had a simple dinner today, just a soup and salad. But, awesome. You know, doing good. You should have had me guess. I would have said chicken and rice. Oh. <laughs> So, Callus, you uh, came to me with the definitive Deftones album ranking. Um, yes. What was your inspiration behind gifting me this 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 topic? Well, back in late November, I just decided to, uh, you know, I felt like listening to some Deftones because I do have like some, you know, uh, random Deftones songs, you know, spread into like some playlists here and there. But I was like, you know what? I should like go through every Deftones album and actually make a Deftones definitive playlist for myself. Because I do that for some artists that I love, you know, but I don't have any Deftones playlists. So that's what I did for like several days. I went through every single Deftones albums and, you know, picked and choose certain, you know, the top of songs that I like the most. And I was like, hey, you know, this would be a great conversation for Yemi since I know that you're also a Deftones fan. So that's why I came to you with it. Actually, um, I appreciate it more than you know, because it actually has been a quite a while since I listened to Deftones. Um, not because I fell out of love with them, but just kind of because, I don't know, I just kind of did not was not thinking of them ever, ever since their Ohms album came out. Uh, so Same, honestly. <laughs> with, with this re-listen, uh, they did cement themselves as like number two or even actually number one on my favorite bands list again. Because you kind of, I mean, you kind of forget how, and of course we'll talk about this, but you kind of forget how just consistently good a lot of Deftones albums are. Um, a lot of their, a lot of their albums, they have um, distinct sounds to them while also still being like, oh, that, that's that's Deftones, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and I, I yeah, I do, like I said, I do have a tier list ready. I don't know if you want to rank them as we go or if you want to wait till the end. That is up to you. Um, I was going to say you can rank them and I will just provide supplementative conversation because I don't, <laughs> it has been like more than a month now since I listened to the all of them. So I don't think I'd be ready to, you know, at this point to rank them. So I'll let you do that. And I'll just like provide my thoughts. If that's okay. okay sure. Yeah, sure. So I do have my, uh, my, Curse my, you, Callus! I do have my tier list here. Uh, it's got all the, it's got all nine of the albums. Yes, nine. Nine albums. Uh, I know there's there's a covers album that's on Spotify, and there's also like a B-Sides album. I actually didn't listen to those, um, so they're not going to be on this ranking area. We're just going with mainline albums. Um, and just to give you guys who don't know some background on the band Deftones, uh, they originally formed in 1988 in California. Uh, a bunch of wow. people out of high school um, just kind of forming a band. Um their main influence was actually Faith No More, which is actually a big influence for a lot of new metal, metal bands. Um, but Deftones actually fully reject the idea that they're new metal, and I wholeheartedly agree. Like, new metal, you think of new metal bands, and you go, oh, Korn, Disturbed, uh, etc. Um, Deftones is definitely not in that category of new metal. Um, they were later dubbed alternative metal because, I mean, you can you can debate this if you want. I really do feel like Deftones doesn't really fit into one single subgenre of metal. I feel like alternative is a great over-encompassing uh, genre for Deftones. 
Hello? Do you want to talk about? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you want to talk about like how you discovered? Like, is there like an origin story to how you discovered Deftones when well, you first I'm, got into them? I am glad you asked that, Callus, because um, my Deftones origins is probably the uh, maybe not the worst, but it's probably one that like any other fan of Deftones would probably frown upon. Um, <laughs> that is because during the days of Rock Band Two. There was a track pack featuring Cherry Waves, Minerva, and Hole in the Earth. And that was my first introduction to Deftones. <laughs> and since then, after listening, after playing through Cherry Waves, uh, I was hooked. <laughs> and I was into them fully. Uh, the first album that I bought from Deftones was Saturday Night Wrist. And of course, I had to hide the album from my mother because the... Uh, album cover is a bit provocative um, we'll get yes. into that later <laughs> um, <laughs> but that was indeed rock band was my first touch with Deftones and I was in high school at the time and once I heard Cherry Waves and the rest of the songs that were in that DLC pack um, I knew I had to go back and just in, in you know eat as much Deftones as I could <laughs> <laughs> no, no shame of that I mean there's tons of bands that I discovered through Guitar Hero and uh rock band and i remember actually i went to a rush concert with a friend and me and my friend we were like the youngest guys there <laughs> and like this older guy came up to us he's like hey you guys are pretty young how did you discover rush and then we were like uh guitar hero <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just pretty funny <laughs> you remember what song it was on guitar hero that uh it's yyc yyz Z, as well, they would say was... in the uk oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> well it's the, the first rush song that ever appeared on the guitar hero right Yes, sure there were more that was too, but it was a cover, so. Yeah. Oh yeah, true. What about you? But, uh, your origins for Deftones? Actually, uh, my origins for Deftones is I went to go see Korn in concert. Ah. And Deftones opened for them. At that point, I had never seen or heard of them before. And uh, like I, they put they put a great performance. And I remember like the one song that stuck in my head is um, our. Our ex queens for my circle queen, mm -hmm. and that was like that. They played that so good live, and it just stuck in my head. Like, and I, as soon as the concert ended, I went home and like I tried to remember it in my head. You know, like that song, that band, so I could like look it up and like listen to more of them. And yeah, from then on, it was history. So let's quickly go over the members of the band uh, from their founding. Uh, we have Chino Moreno, Stephen Carpenter. Chai Chang and Abe Cunningham. And if I've mispronounced those, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, you know, part of me is my pronunciation. The other part is my handwriting. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, of course, there has been some tragedy in the band since their beginning, but we will talk about that when it comes up in our album rankings. Uh, but let's start off with Adrenaline, which is the 1995 album. Uh, it features the, uh, like, glass blown thing on the front of it uh the glass blown seashell douche bag yeah so, something <laughs> some you know if you don't know deftones they are a bit um on the sexual side in most of their albums um but in this album uh they were young they did not have a specific sound i would say but you could definitely tell that there was uh something there um there's there's a there's a few songs on this album that sound like other bands like there is a song that sounds like corn which i believe is called like seven uh it's called like seven something seven, seven words, words. Uh, it's very corn esque like there's a, a little like there's like a, one of those like metal rap sections in the middle of it and then there's another song called uh one week which is very similar to uh another band that influenced them which was helmet uh, it was it's very helmet esque with a lot of uh, power strumming and stuff like that. Um, so you can definitely they're they're wearing their influences on their sleeves for this for this album. It doesn't all come together in a perfect way, but I think there's a, there's enough on here that is actually really fun to listen to nowadays. Knowing where the band went, uh, this one is definitely more raw. It's a little bit jumbled here and there with the track listing. Um, my I favorite... was gonna say that oh, go too. Ahead. This. Yeah, I was gonna say that like this this whole album has like a very raw sound to it. Like it was before they you know really put too much into you know producing and you know the the post production. So it has like you know all the instruments have like this raw sound to it, which I I really enjoy. Yes, um, 
yes, it's definitely their least produced out of all their albums. Um, even Around the Fur, which we'll get to in, in a little bit, uh, does have that uh, heavy producing on it. Um, the album starts off with Bored, which has a very classic opening. Um, if, you know, if you know Deftones, then you know Bored. Uh, also, I really liked Minus Blindfold, One Week, Root, For Real, and Fist on this album. Um, and the one thing that I will say, like, yeah, this album's not going to be high on, on a tier list, in my opinion, simply because, you know, it's, it's decent, it's a fun listen, but it's not as tight as a lot of the other albums. I still don't feel like this is below a C tier. I, I feel like this album is like the, is like a good starting point for the band. They were finding themselves out, they were trying to get a sound, and uh, you can hear some of that sound in the, in, in some of the songs here. Um, but I feel like a nice C tier is is a is the perfect place for this album. And you know what? I don't think that this band has a single has a single album below C tier. And I'm just gonna delete the D tier. Really? I don't. Whoa. I don't, I don't think Deftones <laughs> has anything below a C tier. Wow. I'm surprised. S- spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Adrenaline. It is. <laughs> 1995. Good start. Um, a better start than Blink 182. I'll give them that. <laughs> uh, also for fun I figured that because um, like my playlist I was, I was trying to be very selective with my playlist so I figured it was fun to you know just let you know what songs I picked for my playlist because there's a lot less songs than what you put in your playlist I'll tell you that <laughs> so from this album I put Bored, One Week, Seven Words and For Real those are the four that made it ah. yeah if actually if you're a part of the discord and you want to kind of get a Def, like a definitive Deftones experience. Um, I ordered the playlist. It's about four hours long, of course, so you know you can't listen to it in like one sitting. But I ordered it so <laughs> you that can you, can, you can hit every single era of Deftones in every like four or five songs, um, essentially. Uh, so it's it's not ordered in like my favorite to my least favorites of the Deftones. It's just kind of ordered in like okay, you get hit with like the well, I'm, I, that's a that's a spoiler. You get hit with uh, just the different eras and how their sound kind of formed and how, um, you know, you can, there's like distinct sounds for, or 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 kind of sounds for each album, which does lead us into Around the Fur from 1997, um, and this album I remember when I first listened to it, I remember being like, oh, this isn't good. I don't like this, but. Uh, this album grew on me a lot as I got older, and even now, I think that it's like a really good album. I think it's a really solid album. Um, it's definitely kind of uh, it's kind of got like a little bit of uh, that like um, it's kind of punky, gr- gr- uh, grungy at times, I guess you would say. It's definitely heavy uh, still. It's definitely like alternative metal. Um, it's got a lot of punchy uh, guitar licks and stuff like that. Um, the one thing that like does make me a bit I guess negative with the album is listening to it in one fell swoop songs end on like random notes almost and then the next song kind of just begins without any (laughs) pause and it's a little bit jarring to listen to i'm a person who really likes the flow of albums and the album flow on this one's a bit fucked up (laughs) it's still a great (laughs) album though Um, yeah callus do you have any thoughts on around the fur yeah i think it's a it's a great album it like the one thing I love about Deftones is like so many of their albums starts with a banger and My Own Summer is also a banger, you know, like the the previous album also started with a banger, this one also does, and uh, it's just uh, great at setting the tone, but yeah, I would agree with you, it's definitely, uh, I think, a bit of a weaker album than their debut album. I don't think it's weaker than their debut album, I, I do think it's way better than that. Oh, you do? Okay. Uh, this album actually was their first to go gold and platinum. Gold and Ooh. platinum. Uh, which is pretty crazy for the second album to come from the band. Um, And actually, the band members don't like the album cover. Uh, Essentially, it's a (laughs) candid photo of a party in Seattle. Uh, A random girl, the the guy was going around with with a camera and took a random picture of this girl. And uh, they had to like track her down and make sure that it was okay for them to use it as the album cover. Uh, but in, I guess, in his more mature years, uh, the band has decided that they don't really like the album cover. And you can kind of understand where they're coming from. This 
photo is a very unflattering angle for this person, <laughs> and, and they're really anyone in general. Um, it's definitely like a, 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 a chest, a bosom shot, if you, if you want to say that. But the angle that comes down from the top of her head to her to her torso, essentially, which you, peop, a lot of people take pictures like this for memes <laughs> nowadays. Um, <laughs> so when you're looking at the album, it just kind of gives it like that fisheye without actually being a fisheye. Um, it's just it's it's one of those things. It's, it's just a little bit awkward. And then you got like the random feet coming in on the side <laughs> that, that probably feet? could have been taken out. Uh, to be honest, um, <laughs> but uh, good. for free? Yeah, that's uh, that's the story behind the album cover there. Now, <laughs> I, I I like a lot of songs from this album. Uh, My own summer is obviously a banger. Labia coming in right after that, really good. Um, Around the Fur is also pretty good, the name of the album. My favorite song is Be Quiet and Drive. I think that it's, it, it, if you're if if you're trying, if you're listening to this album, trying to see, you know, oh, where's Deftones going to go next? This is the song you kind of point to because it kind of sounds the most like what Deftones becomes after this album. Um, and there's also uh, Lotion, Die the Flu. And even though it's 37 minutes long on Spotify, MX is actually a pretty banger of a song in general and you gotta wait like 35 minutes to get to the secret song <laughs> um, which is called like Demento or something like that and essentially they recorded it uh, off the off the cuff uh, after smoking marijuana man there you go yeah, it's weird that um, Spotify didn't split up the uh, the songs like they should have <laughs> yeah I mean they, they cut off the Sgt. Pepper's final song they cut off Nirvana's final song on uh, Nevermind because something in the way does have like that 30 minute pause before a secret song on that album too. So I don't know why they didn't do it for this one, but maybe they were just trying to trying to be purist. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. For uh for this album, I three of them made on my playlist. My own summer, around the fur, and be quiet and drive far away, which is also one of my like top favorite Deftones albums. Like Al- uh, probably in my top three, or I mean songs. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great that's a great song. Um, yeah, so my my ranking, uh, I would put it in A tier. I think that this is, uh, if, you're, if you're looking for the Deftones sound from the early days, uh, you can't go wrong. The album flow is really the only thing that I did not like about this album. It's, it's the flow of the album is a bit off-putting, but everything else is very good. Like I said before, I love the punchy guitars. I, I like the vocals and the um, the lyrics in this one. Um, I think that's just a, a generally really good album. Wow, you definitely liked it more than I did. <laughs> Wowie, I sure did. <laughs> I think we're going to disagree about this next one, too. Uh, White oh. Pony from 2000. Uh, this one was when they introduced uh, a guy for turntables and synthesizer named Frank Delgado. Frank Delgado. Um... So, uh, essentially, this album earned them a Grammy for Best per- Metal Performance for the song Elite. Um, this was a turning point for the band, as, to- as said by uh, Chino. Uh, they said that this was the turning point album for the band where they started to mature their sound a little bit more. Um, and you can definitely hear that. Like, a lot of these songs on this album could be slotted into a few albums later on in their career not maybe not the next two albums but definitely later on the career like you could put passenger into like kinoi i'm sorry what's it called koi no yoken or something like that um nino yokoi no hi watch i'm kidding just keep going (laughs) (laughs) i don't get that joke but maybe someone in the chat does (laughs) uh so um the name of this album white pony comes from cocaine uh heroin of course uh, uh, White Pony is, uh, is, is what the, the street refers to, cocaine. Um, and this was also a the first album that they put out that actually featured some major artists. Uh, one of them was Maynard James Keenan from Tool. Yes. Who is the lead singer. And it's actually, actually, it's way more crazy than just him. Like, it's crazy that he actually collaborated with Deftones one because 
Tool is one of those bands that they don't want their music out there. They don't want their stuff stolen. They don't want blah, 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 blah. For him to put his work into a Deftones album really says a lot about how highly he thought of the band at the time. So he's he's been very public about him liking Deftones before. So it's, it's great to see them do, do a collab on a song. And then also, Scott Weiland, or Wayland, from Stone Temple Pilots made an uncredited appearance in one of the songs on the album. Um, I did not pick up on which one it was, but it's in the facts. So, you know, there, oh, he, he was on there somewhere. <laughs> I didn't notice either. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this rest is in the, peace. Uh, yeah. So this is the album that I got introduced to Deftones. It was, uh, I guess, it was the last album they released when I saw them in concert because they played a whole bunch of songs from this particular album. So it was the first one I listened to when I went home. And yeah, it's it's been sitting at you know one of my top favorite, probably my top favorite album from you know out of all of them because of that. Yeah, it's interesting because I didn't really vibe with this one. Um, I there's a lot of songs that I like on it. Don't get me wrong, um, but I, I just felt like I don't know. I, the, a lot of the songs didn't really connect with me. I guess you could say a lot of the songs just didn't really speak to me on the same level as other songs throughout the rest of the band's career. Uh, some songs I did like, Digital Bath, Elite, RX Queen, Street Crab, or I'm sorry, Street Carp. Um, one <laughs> Street of, Crab. <laughs> one of my favorite lines from it is 664, I don't know. You know, it's just a great, great <laughs> line. Uh, Knife Party, Korea, Passenger and and change in the house of flies that's all the songs <laughs> that is not all the songs <laughs> this album is actually a little bit bloated in my opinion there's there's like six or so that i've left out of my list here oh, um, really? okay the, one of the one of the top performing songs was that like uh maggot song the first song um on the on the album and i really did not like that song i thought that it was a bad opening um, and there was also a few other songs mixed in there that I just I just didn't really vibe with. Um, I also think this is one of the weaker, in terms of production value, albums that the that the band had in this era for them. Like you, you say what you want about Around the Fur, but it definitely has a a certain flair to it with its production. Whereas White Pony, it just kind of feels it just it just kind of feels a bit. Um, generic in terms of production in my opinion mm. which is why on my list i do put it above the first album but it is a c-tier album for me personally okay um I oh i'm sorry with you with the, uh... it's a b-tier album oh really okay yes cool <laughs> but yes i agree this one of the few albums that does not start with a banger because i did not like back to school either but I do have six songs that made it to my playlist from this album, which is uh, Fatiseria. I never know how to pronounce this one. <laughs> <laughs> Digital Bath, RX Queen, Teenager, Knife Party, and Change in House of Flies. I love all of those. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad of a selection. Okay, next up is the self-titled album, simply called Deftones from 2003. Uh, this is the last album produced by Terry Date until later. Um, this one, they tried some different things with, and I think if you listen to the first, like, half of this album, you kind of understand what we're talking about here. Uh, they went into a genre called Trip Hop and Shoe Gaze, which we'll just keep calling them alternative metal, because that's a better label for them. Um, I've never heard of these labels. <laughs> yeah, I also was like, what, <laughs> when I first read that? Uh, this was originally going to be called Lovers, and there was actually a song that had the word Lovers in it, uh, which appears on the B-Sides album that we did, that I didn't listen to. Um, but essentially it was supposed to be called Lovers, and the, 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 song, uh, you know, the, the lead song was supposed to be that Lovers song. I guess I didn't feel like it was a strong enough song to make it onto the album. Also, um, Chino says that this was one of the slowest recording processes that he ever had with an album, and that, that, that and he says that it did impact the album in general. Although I didn't really hear too much of an impact in terms of quality. Um, this is also Callus. I don't know if you knew this. Here's a fun fact: one of the most expensive albums ever produced, two point oh, really? five million dollars. 
Wow. Hi. <laughs> it is right above Michael Jackson's bad and right below something else. I don't remember. Uh, but it's right above bad by Michael Jackson. Pretty crazy. Wow. That's insane. <laughs> um, so this is an interesting album because most of the songs are reminiscent of what they've already done in in their past repertoire. I would say maybe it's a little bit heavier at times. Um, but this one did introduce to us the the hit on this album, which was Minerva, um, where it just is like this completely different vibe. Uh, I guess that's where Shoegazer comes from, essentially, is like because you listen to Minerva and it kind of takes you on a, an actual trip, like not just with drugs, but just in general. You close your eyes and you just kind of see like a, a, like a fucking like star wars scene or something like that it's just it's one of those it's one of those songs that i think w when people think of deftones i think they kind of think of this song sound even though deftones is not specifically minerva you know like there there are like each album still has that deftones heavier punchy sound um but this album the standout really was minerva even though there's a lot of good songs on here minerva is the one song that people go when you, when you think of Deftones, I think there's a couple songs that pop into people's minds, and I think Minerva is one of those songs. Yeah, it is a great song. And uh, I also think that this one starts with uh, Hexagram, which is a banger and a half. I love that one. Ah, see, that's where it's we differ. I actually didn't. I, didn't, I actually didn't like Hexagram. Really? I like oh, I, I like the it. second <laughs> song better, Needles and, and Pins. <laughs> um, that is also a great one. But uh, yeah, on top of that. Obviously, Minerva, great song. Good Morning, Beautiful, Death Blow, uh, When Girls Phone Boys, Battle Axe, Bloody Cape, and Lucky. All uh, my favorite songs on here. And Lucky, another song where they kind of... Lucky you? Well, they kind of channel their um, uh, their uh, influences, and it kind of has like a Nine Inch Nails vibe to it, which is kind of cool. Another fun fact is uh, Lucky You plays during the end credits for Matrix Reloaded. Ah, I guess I gotta watch that movie now. Ooh, nice. <laughs> I think it's Lucky You, and I think it's Matrix Reloaded. If I don't, if I'm not, if I'm not incorrect. <laughs> ah, someone fact check him. Someone in the chat will fa fact check. Him. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I think that this is a this is actually genuinely a great album. I think that it's. Um, not it's i don't think it's i don't know is it underrated i guess i would say because a lot of people who talk about deftones talk more about white pony and and saturday night wrist and whatever um i do think this is like a really solid album i think it's right up there with white pony uh, i think it's better than white pony in my opinion um i guess the only reason why it's a little bit you know it's in the b tier is because i, I just kind of wish that there were more songs like minerva on there i mean you give us minerva and then you don't have another song that channels that same energy um kind of makes me go ah i wish it, i <laughs> wish it was just like the minerva album which uh does lead me into saturday night wrist from 2006 because the first half of this album is pretty much channeling that minerva energy that shoegazer energy that trip hop yeah. energy i guess you would say i was gonna say that too yeah <laughs> Um, unfortunately for Saturday Night Wrist, which used to be my favorite album by them, my first album by the, uh, that I had from them, uh, I think that this album completely falls apart at, at the second half of it. Um, but wait a second. Uh, for the self-titled album, uh, five of these songs made it to my playlists, which is Hexagram, Needles and Pins, Minerva, Deathblow, and The Lucky You. Callus sucking the energy right out of my statement there. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think after mine, which actually features Sher Serge Tark Tunk Tunk, the guy from System of a Down. <laughs> um, Surf Tanky in it. <laughs> I think this album really does take a huge no nose dive. Um, I understand that. Not you know that some people might disagree with me. And even though like Xerxes and Kim Dracula are still good songs, I just think there's so much there's there's too many misses in the second half of this album, um, including Up Up Down Down A B A B Start Select, um, which isn't channeling Mario vibes. It actually I felt like it channeled Donkey Kong Country vibes in my opinion. Really? Um, <laughs> but there's other songs on this album that I just really like. When I listened to when I was young, I also felt like they were bad, but. I mean, I guess not bad, but just kind of like okay in in ways. Um, and even, but I still thought it was the best album ever because of that really strong, like 
rain like run of five songs that just like blows the doors off of anything else that deftones has ever done uh but then you got songs like pink cell phone oh, yeah! and rats 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 and 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 whatever and i just thought that the album really fell apart midway through um because this album has such a killer start to the yes. the, the, the first five songs in this album are like the ones holding the weight of the world for this album. The rest of the album is kind of like the little people below just going, hey, we're here to help, but they can't really reach the world, right? Um, but, yeah. <laughs> that is... <laughs> I that I can agree it. with you with this. Uh, uh, once again, they start with Holding the Earth, which is a banger in three quarters. I love that song. It's also like probably in my top five favorite you know, Deftone songs. Yeah. And yeah, the second half is kind of just false off card. Yeah, Pink Cell Phone yeah, is very... Dis uh, it, it, one, it's disturbing and disgusting at the same time. Uh, one of the final lines in Pink Cell Phone said by uh, the female who is talking, um, she's talking about, like, uh, butt sex and foreskin and poop being trapped in the foreskin. Uh, very, very fun stuff. Um, great subject matter. Um, but we do have some tragedy for the band here. This is the final album for Chai Chang, who was the bassist for the Deftones originally. Uh, he was in a car accident in 2008 and went to a coma, uh, and uh, he never returned to the band. So it's a, a sad thing because I think Chai Chang is a great was a great bassist. I think that he had a very definitive sound. The person who they got to take over the position is also really good, but there's something about these bass licks in this album that just really, really hit hard. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's unfortunate that uh, what happened happened. Very sad. So yeah, my my list of songs here are, are it's a bit short, and it's the ones that you kind of expect: uh, "Hole in the Earth," "Rapture," "Beware," "Cherry Waves," "Mine," "Xerxes," and "Kim Dracula" are are the best songs on the album. Um, and I think you, I mean, I used to really love "Cherry Waves." I actually did a cover of the song on my Facebook, which. I would cringe too hard and probably die if I played it on here. Um, <laughs> but Cherry Ways was like the song for me for quite some time with Hole in the Earth being right there. Uh, on this on this listen through though, I think Beware took over my love over Cherry Waves and Hole in the Earth. Really? I think Beware is a just a brilliant song. Um, I really, really love that one. Hmm. Um, Callus, what were the songs that made it onto your playlist for this album? Well, from this album, four songs made it. And that is Hole in the Earth, Cherry Waves, Main, and Drive. Main? Yeah. I call it Mine. Mine. Either one. <laughs> I Is never, it... I don't really know. Mine. It's kind of, it's the German word, I believe. Mine. Mine Kampf. Makes sense. Whoa. Hey now, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I forgot to mention this. Album cover. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a very productive one. It's obviously a woman getting railed from behind. Uh, this is from a 1970s grindhouse porno called Roxanne, so you can look that up in your spare time um, if you want to check that out. Let me write that, that down real quick. Uh, but Grindhouse, I know, is just from general fact-checking, is known for, like, very artsy kind of pornos. Like, you can tell kind of from the album cover, like, the woman's face is kind of like her eye and mascara is, is, like, the main focus, and then she's, like, being railed, and then there's another woman in there, and um, it's, it's a very artsy porno um, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> there you go. I could be into it. <laughs> That's right. You don't know until you check it out, right? Right. <laughs> uh, so next up um, is Diamond Eyes, and I believe this one came out in 2010. Spotify had the wrong years, so I had the wrong years written down for the next like two albums for hmm. quite some time before I realized that they were wrong. Um, but this one actually came out in 2010. Uh, this one introduced the bassist Sergio Vega, who took over the, for the band all the way up until their newest album. Um, and there was originally an album called Eros that the band was working on before Chai Chang uh, was in the car accident. And it's actually an unfinished, unreleased six album that they probably will never release at this point, um, which is kind of sad. Uh, the good news is, though, is that this is their first Billboard Top 10. It was number six on the Billboard Top 200. Um, and uh, the reason, the real core reason behind the album was was that Chino 
wanted to make a more upbeat album, something to kind of um, counteract all the press, the pressing, the pressive subject matter that has been both in his life because of marriage troubles and stuff, and then drug issues, and also with the um, uh, what happened to the bassist in the band. They wanted they wanted to make a more upbeat album, something that was a bit more optimistic lyrically, even though it still sounds like a Deftones album. Uh, lyrically, it's not about sex and drugs and dying and shit. Um, it is a more upbeat band uh, uh, album with with more upbeat lyrics. And this one was actually their quickest recorded album. They got together in in studio, uh, which was different from what they had done in the past for the last couple albums. They were kind of in their own studios using some sort of uh, audio tool to put it all together. But this time they they met in person. They went to the recording studio. They practiced songs so much that they got them perfect. And then when they recorded the album, they were all playing at the same time. And of course, they had to add the extra stuff on top of it, the layer, the different sounds on top of it. And um, Callus, what are your thoughts? What do you what do you got here? Interesting. Uh, I remember when this album first came out, uh, I didn't really vibe with it too much. I don't know why. I just felt like it was so different. But overall, I did like you know, given a re-listen in the last. In the last few years, I've actually did kind of grow to like it more and more, and I actually do like it a lot. I forgot to rank Saturday Night Wrist. Oh. Um, it's C tier above the original album. Cool. Right there. Okay. Um, you may or may not be surprised to hear this, but Diamond Dies is my favorite album from the band. Whoa. Uh, this is this straight up to S tier. I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna dance around the subject. Wow. Uh, when I was when I was re-listening to the album, I was writing down every single song, and I was like, by the time the album ended, I was like, why well, do I even have to write this down? I, I and, and, and essentially in quotations, I just put the whole album, <laughs> the whole the whole thing. <laughs> um, nice. I feel like if we're think if we're talking about definitive Deftones albums, this is the definitive one for me. Like this one has everything that I want from a Deftones album. It's got the the punchy guitar riffs, it's got the layered guitar chords, it's got the amazing vocals, it's got the synth and stuff in the background to kind of layer on top of everything else going on. Um it just it has the best lyrics, in my opinion. It has the best flow, in my opinion, even though other albums in the future do have good flow as well. Um, I just, I, I cannot think, when I think of Deftones, I think of the songs from this album. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate that uh, you didn't vibe with it as much as me, but I, I guess I guess this is just me getting back at you for a white pony, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. It does start with like a, an insane banger with Diamond Eyes, though, Ali. That's... Another top tier song for me. This is actually the one album in this re-listening that I re listened to four times, not in a row, but four times in general. Um, and uh, when I made my uh, my Deftones playlist on Spotify, uh, you will see that this album shows up s very often throughout throughout the entire thing. Um, just to go through it, Diamond Eyes, awesome song. Not my favorite on the album, but pretty close. Uh, Royal, a good follow-up to Diamond Eyes. Command Control, a, a song that harkens back to like something like White Pony. Um, You've Seen the Butcher has that really good guitar riff. The dun-dun-dun-dun, dun-dun-dun, dun-dun-dun, dun So good. I love that so much. It's a great opening. I actually used to use that for an opening to my old YouTube channel's uh, videos that have been taken down. Um, Beauty School is a great song might be my favorite on the album. I think it's like one of those perfect Deftone songs. Um, but Prince right after it is also really good too. Like I just smile my entire way through this album. It's just so fucking good. And it's also one of, one of the rare Deftones albums that I like sing along to the entirety of the album. Like there's a couple songs here and there on a lot of these other albums that I won't know the words to. But Diamond Eyes, I'm pretty good at singing along. I, I know pretty much wow. all the words. Um, Rocket Skates was actually the breakout hit on this album. Um, which also is a fantastic song. Uh, Sex sure Tape, is. you know, great al uh, great song there. Um, Risk, great song. Uh, 976 Evil. Actually, Risk, 976 Evil, and This Place is Death all link together in one congealed um, uh, flow of music, and they're all amazing songs. Um, this Place is Death is one of my favorite closings, probably my favorite closing to a Deftones album. It is just such a perfect amalgamation of what the entire album 
was about. And um, yeah, I think that the uh, Diamond Eyes 2010, perfect album. It came out at the perfect time for me because I still had a CD player in my car and I would just jam this fucking album all the time. <laughs> And uh, in my now ma more mature era of my life, I can really sit down and appreciate what this album does in general. I think that there's so much good going on here. Um, I already talked about the specifics, but I think there's just... This album speaks to me. It really, it really does. And it's one of the reasons why Deftones is so high on my list of bands is because of this album right here. Nice. For me in particular, this... Uh... Oh, four Don't, songs made nope. it to my playlists. Put them all no, on there, Callus. Put them all on there. All of them. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta be very selective with my playlists. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. I'm, I, so, I just, I just. <laughs> so the four songs that made it is Diamond Eyes, Beauty School, Rocket's Kiss, which I think is probably my favorite song from this album, and Risk. Very good. Okay, well... After all that passion for this album, I'm, I'm, a, bit, I'm a bit winded, <laughs> but we, we, we trudge on. We trudge forward. Uh, yeah, I already, put to this, go. I already put this at, num at the S tier. Um, I think you'll know where it's going to be on my final raking. Um, next up is Koi no Yokan from 2012, Ooh. which Me translates no um, to Premonition of Love. Oh, really? I didn't know that. I had no idea. Yep, uh, <laughs> I don't know why. I, I was never curious to find out what that meant. <laughs> Uh, how are you doing today, Taylor? How are you doing today, Taylor Tanj? Um, so yeah, uh, Premonition of Love is what the name, what the title essentially is. Uh, this one topped at number eleven on the Billboard 200, um, which is another pretty good album uh, album ranking for them. Uh, this album was the last Deftones album that I that I bought before Ohms came out, um, and this album actually came out at the worst time. <laughs> Because I bought the album and I think I listened through it once before I bought my new car without a CD player. And then, because I was moving, I sold my entire CD collection. <laughs> so I listened to it once and then forgot about it. On re-listen, on re-listen, Callus, I don't know if you agree with this, but this is a banger of an album. Like I didn't, I didn't realize how good this album was. Um, <laughs> it's heavy. It's much heavier than most of their stuff. It's very dynamic. Um, it actually uses. Uh, they used a fat, fractual audio system with it, which means that the guitars uh, were made to sound like there were multiple guitars playing. It was multi-amp kind of system in one, oh, which is pretty cool. Which also adds to the heavier heaviness of this album it's heavier because of the different systems that they were using um i i really like this album like it, it this was actually a sneaky a sneaky hit for me i i was not expecting to like this one as much as i did uh when i was listening to it i do like it but probably not as much it's it's definitely not high in my ranking personal ranking of deftones albums but i did i do appreciate a lot of the songs but it's it's sort of like half of the songs i really like and then half of the songs i just i don't really care for so if that makes sense i kind of like diamond's eyes more than this album <laughs> hey me too i like diamond eyes more than this album um but i still love koi no yokin um i think you don't like this album as much along with diamond eyes because they are heavier and i don't think you like heavier music is that a is that, an, is that something that I can ascertain from your music taste? Yeah, I think so. Although I do like some of their heavy songs. Some? I know, some, yeah, like uh, Poultry Guys, I really like. That's a, I think that's a pretty heavy song, right? Um, it, it, that, that's like one of the more kind of uh, melancholy songs on the album, I would say. Melancholy, really? It's, it's, it's heavy, but it's, 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 it's not as heavy as like leather or graphic nature or tempest or something like that mm. but yeah yeah you're right i do i don't like really vibe with like the you know extremely heavy stuff as much as you do and that does lead me to also i mean white pony is a very tool-esque kind of album i would say very meticulous very uh um uh very melodic i guess you would say uh, so i i do understand i think i'm getting into the brain of callus here folks i think we're, <laughs> i think we're kind of diving in here whereas me i like i like the more heavier stuff callus likes the bit more uh light light i guess i guess not really light but i guess the i, more, I like um, more complex more, stuff like yeah layered yeah. layered stuff but that's i mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah. And, and you know what's funny though is that I just noticed I didn't even add the song that includes Maynard from White Pony into my playlist, which <laughs> is funny because you know, <laughs> which is fine. I don't really like that song that much anyway, so it's fine. Oh, you don't even like Passengers? <laughs> okay. No. So. Yeah, I, I really like this album. I was surprised at how much I like this one, but it makes sense because it is a bit of a heavier Deftones album. Uh, the songs that I wrote down, uh, we have Swerve City, Romantic Dream, Leathers, Poltergeist, Graphic Nature, Tempest, Rosemary, and Goon Squad. Um, all my favorite songs there. And I, I think that the rest of the songs on the album are still good. Um, I just think that you know the standouts really are the ones that just have those killer licks and... Um, they're probably these are probably the heaviest songs in the album honestly and I, 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 I now this is not to say that i don't like more melodic stuff or more lighter stuff i mean i listen to dance gavin dance for god's sake um and it's they are like my favorite band next to um deftones and um um whoop i'm blanking but that's okay <laughs> um yeah i, I yeah uh, yeah i i really like this one and and to rank it on here i would put it above around the fur in a tier i think that's it's, it's a very very strong album oh sorry what rank do you put it in a for apple a. okay nice cool only three songs made it to my playlist from this album sad <laughs> sort of city poltergeist and tempest all right, all right, all right. With Sword City, it's just like a really cool, uh, fun opening to the album. <laughs> it is, it, it is, yeah. And that's the other thing that I want to mention too. Like, you can kind of take any of the songs from any of these albums and put them in like a, it's like, and just kind of play them to me, and I, I will ninety nine percent be able to tell you which album they're from, just because each album is so distinct at times. Mm. Um, I know some of the albums, like like the self-titled album, there's like one song that sounds different and the rest of them are kind of more of that um, alternative metal that you know them for. Um, but I, I would say that each album does have a, its own unique, distinct ring to it. And I, sh I, I might be able to pick it out now now that I've re-listened to the albums a couple times. <laughs> I might test you. Better be ready. I'm ready. Well, okay. You gotta, <laughs> I, I do need to prepare, but I'll be ready. <laughs> next, next stream. I'll test you. All right. We got two more albums here. Gore from 2016. Uh, this is an out. This is my first time listening to this album, um, so mm. I went into it with a fresh blank slate. Very this one curious hit to see. <laughs> number two on the Billboard 200. Wow, really? Crazy stuff. That's insane. Um, when oh, I first heard this album, I didn't like it, and I kind of just fell off from Deftones for like years. <laughs> Wait, th but, this sorry, one this, this one made you fall off of Deftones for years? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I can see why. I, I didn't... I, it was just felt so... I felt like they were trying to do, like, be experimental, you know? But what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that there's something missing from this album. And I think it is the layers that Deftones is known for. I think the... Uh, just something doesn't sound right about it. And it might be because in 2013, Chai Chang died of cardiac arrest uh, in his while in his coma... Um, so that might have that probably affected the band's recording and and how the band felt at the time. Um, I just I just I really think that there is just something missing from this album, and it could be because Chino at the time was also touring with his side band called Crosses um, in, in in like 2014, um, and eventually they sat down to. Uh, to record this album after their tour and it might have been that outside influence kind of like how blink 182 was influenced by angels and airwaves tom delong doing angels and airwaves i feel like crosses kind of uh influenced gore a little bit um just just in terms of just the the style and, and the record and like how the, the the band sounds um chino even admits that there was a tension between the musical styles that they were doing uh, it, uh for this album um and uh, here's another fun thing. Here, here, okay, here's a fun thing. I'm sorry. Here's a fun thing. Uh, Sergio Ver Vega actually used a bass six on this album. What does that mean? You tell me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, does that mean that the bass has six six uh, strings? I, I don't know. I think it's the sixth version of the bass. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What the heck is Greedy Waffles doing here? I don't know. I was about to ask. What is going on in chat? being a distraction what he's doing um so yeah I, I this album has a lot of different moods uh it kind of switches between happy and angry a lot 
Um, but it also is just like, I, I don't know, this one just doesn't really, it doesn't really feel right, in my opinion. <laughs> it doesn't really mm. feel right. It still feels like a Deftones album, but... And uh, yet you don't want to put any any album in D tier. Interesting. No, because I do still think that there are, are, are some pretty good songs on this album that, that, that reach it out of the D tier threshold. Um, one of my favorites on here was uh, Geometric Headdress. I think that this this song kind of uh, I, it just kind of showcases how the writing process for Deftones is just so good uh, because there's so much going on in the in that song. Um, also, Phantom Bride was another standout for me personally on this album. Um, I really really enjoyed that song, um, but there is a reason why this album doesn't have a lot of songs in my playlist. Uh, it's the least out of all of them, and that's because Prayers Slash Triangles. Um, doomed user geometric headdress oh my gosh I'm, I'm burping here um, <laughs> Petua Pet, Petura Infantia <laughs> Xenon Phantom Bride and Rubicon were the ones that I, I thought were standouts on here but in general uh, yeah it just it doesn't I think I think the vibes off for it I, I think there's there's something missing it doesn't it doesn't feel it doesn't feel as good while listening to it as a lot of the other songs. Uh, I'm sorry, a lot of the other albums. And uh, maybe it's maybe it's something with how they produce this album. It just sounds a bit. I don't know. It's, it, just, it just sounds a bit empty. Like there's something missing. And maybe that's how it's supposed to sound because they did lose Chai Chang in the in the past couple of years since uh, since they started maybe. recording the album. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so it just doesn't. It doesn't. But in the end, even if it is an artistic decision, it doesn't sound great for the most part. Just produce, produce, production wise. Man, but and... there are a couple uh, songs that I did like. So the oh, yeah, three sure. songs that, three songs that made it to my playlist from this album are Prayers Triangles, Hearts Wires, and Phantom Bride. And this one is in C tier above the first album, Adrenaline. Um, I listened to these albums back to back after I was done with my initial listen through. And I decided that the raw nature of adrenaline was still great. I love it, but there's always there's always something about the newer or uh, at least the later Deftones albums that um, elevates them higher than that original sound. So um, I do think it's a little bit better than Adrenaline, uh, but they're kind of on the same the same like sp spear, I guess you could say. They're, they're two sides of a of a coin. And that leads us to Ohms from 2020. Um, the Terry Date, the original producer, came back to produce this one, and you can definitely tell. Um, Sergio actually left the band, uh, the new bassist, in 2021. So we recorded this album. This is the last album with Sergio F so far, as we know. Uh, this album uh, was nominated for a Grammy for Best Rock Performance for Ohms. Uh, this album came out during COVID times, uh, which... Um, caused the band to not be able to work together in studio uh, but I think that that doesn't really matter this album is very tight it's very well produced and I think this is one of the best Deftones albums it just kind of encompasses everything that Deftones is and will hopefully be in the future um, it's a very very meticulously written and performed album and I love the fact that these songs are longer I think most of these songs are longer than anything else that they have put out with six to, to eight minute songs going into dipping into different, um, just many different sounds and many different layered effects. It's a very cool album, a very nice album to listen to. Really love this one. I uh, really like this album when I first heard it, uh, given it like a more recent listen to, I wasn't really as high on it as I was when like when the fir album first came out. I don't know why. I do think it's like a great album. I do like the album, but I just feel like all the songs are just good. And there's only three songs that made it to my playlist from this album. Name them off. Uh, I want you to take a guess. What three songs do you think made it from this album? Hmm. This Link is Dead? Yes, that's one. <laughs> Genesis? No. Ceremony? No. Ohms? Yes. One more. Pompeii? No. <laughs> mm, headless? No. Urantia? 
Yes, that's what it There is. we go. All right. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because this one actually has less songs than most of the albums that they put out. Um, there's actually, I think, I think there's only like eight songs on this album, and I wrote uh, down only ten songs. Ten songs, and I wrote down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I was only, I'm only missing two songs on this one, and well. even even those two songs are still good. I enjoy listening to them, but um, I, I do like the longer nature of the songs. I like how varied they are throughout the uh, throughout the listen. Um, Pompeii is a big uh, example. Um, because it goes through so many different changes throughout the course of it. And of course, there's still like a chorus and stuff like that, but it, it does change up as you go through it. Um, I like the production on this album a lot. Uh, it definitely harkens back to something like the production for Diamond Eyes or even Saturday Night Wrist at times, um, while also still being its own mature album. Like this album is definitely like the the band members are... are mature in their sound they know the sound that they want to have and they definitely followed through with that the album cover uh this is actually um people speculate it's not confirmed people speculate that the eyes on the album cover are from a candid photo of chai cheng and then there are twelve thousand nine hundred ninety five dots on the cover which was designed oh. by a person named frank maddox so uh Take that one to your trivia night. <laughs> and in case you didn't know, ohms is the uh, unit measurement of uh, electrical resistance. Yeah, I try to forget science class, you know. <laughs> That's not science as well. I guess it is. <laughs> uh, and of course, my favorite songs in here, Genesis, Ceremony, Urantia. Um, I can't read my handwriting. It starts with an E. Error. Error, yes. Um, <laughs> the next one, I can't read my handwriting. Mathematics? The Spell of Mathematics. The Spell of Mathematics. Pompeii. This link is dead. Headless and Ohms are my favorite songs on here. Cool. And I would rank this one in the S tier as well. Uh, wow. I, can listen, I can listen to this one all day, and which I proved by listening to it all day yesterday. And this, <laughs> and you'll never <laughs> guess what album I listened to all day today, which was Diamond Eyes. So, in the end, my personal Deftones definitive ranking um, coming in at number nine is Adrenaline followed by Gore, Saturday Night Wrist, White Pony, the self-titled album Deftones, Around the Fur, Koi no Yoken, Ohms, and Diamond Eyes at the top. And you can see my my tier list right here um, for the definitive ranking as well. I um, Once again, I really appreciate this topic in particular because Deftones is a band that I kind of forgot these past few years, and maybe it's because I didn't put out any new work, or maybe it's because I just was distracted by everything else going on in the world. Um, but Ohms did win Best Album of the Year, the year that came out for me, which is surprising that I kind of <laughs> forgot about them for, for some time before finally revisiting them this past couple weeks. And uh, Interesting. By doing that, it reasserted my love for them, and like I said, they're like my number like two or even number one band uh, again at this point. And I really do hope that they keep going, even though they um, they might not. It's it's up in the air at this point. I hope they do. And we did our due diligence with uh, both of us putting them, you know, nominating both 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 of us nominated them for uh, you know uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes, uh, I was actually going to mention that, but I forgot to write it down. Um, but they <laughs> they have been around for more than twenty five years, so they are eligible to be put into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And actually, they are at the moment pretty close to the top for the fan uh, recommended uh, nominations which is pretty cool so hopefully cool. i mean i think they deserve to get in i mean the the, the one thing that i forgot to mention um is they they are pioneers in something that i like to call inhale screaming uh during adrenaline and around the fur you can kind of hear him uh doing like a um hold on give, let me do a drink of water before doing this <laughs> all right because i'm actually nice. pretty decent at it for the most part um, but essentially, you hear him go, something like that, <clears throat> kind of like a pig squeal, <laughs> something like that, <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> and um, <laughs> they're actually pioneers in that inhale screaming. I know it sounds kind of funny, but uh, you can hear it a lot on Adrenaline and a little bit on Around the Fur, and they eventually got out of that, but... Um, <laughs> Essentially, Inhale Screaming is more popular nowadays in bands like La Rona Shore, 
um, and other ones, of course, that I, I, I don't have a list in my head readily available. Um, but I they love actually... the reactions to this to, to in chat to you doing that. <laughs> This is a very serious, guys. Um, inhale screaming is a very serious topic. Uh, but they are, they, I mean, they are pioneers in that. There was no one else doing that at the time, and it made their sound um, very unique uh, back in the day when they first came around. So um, if, if anything, not only are they pioneers in that, but they are also pioneers in the alternative metal genre. Um, I think it's actually a sin to call them new metal because this is more than new. When I think of new metal, you think of the more generic kind of bands. They kind of have that 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 sound that's, you know, you, you listen to it and it's like, oh, that's new metal. <laughs> you know, like Disturbed, <laughs> Slipknot, and Korn are, are the ones that come to mind, of course. And even though those are three very distinct bands, they have one thing in common, and that is radio-friendly hits. Deftones doesn't really have a radio-friendly hit in here, Okay. They did their thing. They kept doing their thing, and that's why new metal. No, this is this is alternative metal at the base. It's more things if you look into it. And sure. yeah, if you haven't listened to Deftones, listen to Deftones. I posted uh, a definitive playlist um, in my Discord in the music section. Uh, if you want to listen to that, it has all eras of Deftones in an order that will kind of keep it spiced up. It'll keep uh, keep it going, keep it flowing. Um, so you have all the different eras kind of playing um, one after the other. So you can kind of hear the different sounds that they've had over the years without them being clumped together in one bunch. You can also, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to poo poo on you for shuffling it either. Like, I don't care. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that is that. That is the Deftones album ranking. Um, I think I had more fun with this one than I did with Blink-182, even though I still really love Blink-182. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, really fun time. Thank you, Callus, for the suggestion. It was a, a very good one. Yeah, and thank you for having me. It was definitely a fun conversation to be had. Yes, I appreciate you coming on and, here and sharing some uh, wrong opinions about some of my favorite <laughs> albums. <laughs> sure, uh, sure. <laughs> Um, but we're going to move on, Callus. We're going to move on here. But I do appreciate okay. you very much. We love you. We yeah. appreciate you. Um, go re-listen re to Koi no Yoken and listen to it with a different mindset. <laughs> All right, I will. I'll do that. And on that note, I will say <clears throat> goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See, there you go, folks. All right, Callus, he's leaving. He's gone. He's walking out the door. Bye. Wait, I'm trying to figure out how to quit. I will. Oh, there we go. Okay, bye. <laughs> I will... All right, we moved him. He's, he's gone. He's out of here. See you later. Y'all wanted the sound clip me doing the pig squeal. I mean, man, there you go. Callus came come in, coming in uh, with his own, with his own right there. Um, I actually, I, I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to do it as well as I usually do. Um, when I'm in the car and I'm just listening to a, an album that has inhale screaming, I can do it pretty decently, all things considered. Um, but of course, as, as soon as I try and do it here, um, the ending was fine. The ending was fine. Why am I so, why am I so far up all of a sudden? Maybe it's when someone joined the call. Okay. Um, wow. What a great segment. Um, we almost don't even have time to do the final one, but we're gonna do it anyway. We're gonna power through uh, because we're gonna be talking about the NFL playoffs. How you doing today, Squid Daddy? Naituoso. I think I missed saying hello to Ninja earlier. I apologize about that. Uh, Naituoso says, My ex made the same noise when I was beating those pork loins like I was Kermit the Frog. Uh, there you go. <laughs> um, and Squid Daddy is more like an L Daddy because he doesn't like petting Zoo Justice by uh, Dance Kevin Dance. Um, so there you go. Uh, <laughs> so the NFL playoffs, um, if you don't know what the NFL is, uh, it is sports. It's football. Um, my favorite sport, actually. I really don't, I don't really, I don't really watch any other sports besides football. So, you know, pretty much five months out of the year, I'm enamored and, and into football. Um, I, I don't know if Greedy Waffles is joining. He didn't confirm or deny it. I guess we'll just wait for him to maybe say yes i'm here or maybe he won't be 
But that is for him to decide. He doesn't have to come on if he doesn't want to. Uh, we're going to go over our, uh, my, my Super Bowl prediction and also my uh, my tentative playoff bracket. Um, also, Greedy Waffles attached a, a, a another thing to this um, about building a new team and who I would, where I would build and stuff like that. I'm just going to quickly say I would definitely want to rebuild a team in St. Louis. I feel like the St. Louis fan base deserves a new team. Yes, I know. Praise me as a saint. And uh, I had a few names in mind for the for the new team name because obviously you can't use Rams anymore. Um, they got the Gateway Arch there, so they could be called the St. Louis Archers. Kind of a dual meaning where you have the arch, but you also have these the the archery. You know, kind of cool. I I thought that was kind of a cool idea. Uh, don't steal that one from me. I also have the St. Louis Blues because St. Louis is known for its blues scene. Um, and I feel like blues and kind of like the New Orleans jazz. I think it's new. Is it New Orleans? Yeah, whoever doesn't matter. I think that'd be a decent name. I looked up what the state animal was and I couldn't find anything other than that. They have a lot of raccoons, <laughs> but I feel like calling the calling them the St. Louis raccoons wouldn't have the same ring as the archers. Also, apparently there's a lot of mules <laughs> in St. Louis as well <laughs> that I didn't know about. Um, so yeah, there you go. And who would my coaching staff be? You got Brian Flores. Um, I would put in... Um, so you got Bar Brian Flores for defensive coordinator. Okay. Um, for head coach... For head coach, you're going to go with Mike Shanahan. And for offensive coordinator, go with Kevin Stefanski right now. Okay. There you go. And the, 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 I mean, obviously the most important position is a quarterback. I think corner is also a very important role, um, not only on the offensive side of the ball, but also the defensive side of the ball. So if I was to rank the bet, the, the most important positions in terms of football, uh, it's definitely quarterback, offensive corner, like guard, and then uh, defensive, um, corner as well to rush the opposite opposing quarterback, try and give them the least amount of time that they can possibly get. Um, I think that those are the three most important uh, roles right now, even though wide receiver and running back and whatever else is very important too. Uh, there's just something about a team that has all those pieces that really changes the game up. So yeah, anyway, uh, let's talk about our my predictions for the uh, the rest of the season here, the wild card weekend and onward. Uh, right now, this week, we got Texans versus Browns, Dolphins versus Chiefs, Steelers versus Bills, Packers versus Cowboys, Rams versus Lions, and Eagles versus Buccaneers. And we're going to start with my hometown team, the Cleveland Browns versus the Texans. I do think that we'll be able to get the win this week. And, of course, I may be eating my words next week. Um, I am nervous about this game because C.J. Stroud and his team have been very very good this year um a surprise sleeper team a lot of people said because uh they you know they got a new staff they got a new quarterback they got blah 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 blah, blah. they also have had almost as much uh, they've also been as almost as much almost as injured as the browns have been the browns have lost two quarterbacks right um deshaun watson and dtr we've lost amari cooper uh he might be back this week though uh, we've lost plenty of safeties, plenty of offensive linemen, defensive linemen. Um, we also lost Nick Chubb earlier in the year, which is a huge crushing blow. But other players have stepped up in their place and caused us to actually be a competitive team. What do you know? Uh, also, I think that Jim Schwartz's coaching for the Browns defense is also another reason why we are so high up here. Like, if Kevin Stefanski ever gets fired, which I don't know if he will at this point because he's led us to two playoff berths in, like, four years... Um, I think that Jim Schwartz would be a good replacement for him midseason or even in, in general because I feel like he's he really coached up this defense that has kind of been a bit broken and battered. Um, but I do think that the Browns will get the win this week, uh, even though it's gonna it's probably going to be a pretty close contest. But I do feel like between the two teams, I think the Texans have less weapons at their disposal. I don't think their run game is as strong as ours, even without Nick Chubb. Um, and I do think that our wide receivers are about equal. But the one thing that the Texans don't have that we have is Joe Flacco, baby. That's right. The Stone Age Pony back at it again to to get another chance at uh, getting to a Super Bowl. Do I think he's going to lead us to a Super Bowl? Yeah, I don't know. 
But I will say that I think the Browns have a very strong chance of winning this one. Greedy, this is the last thing I'm going to say about Elden Ring. What boss are you fighting right now? And if it's not, if you're about to say something different than what the actual final boss is, I have bad news for you. <laughs> uh, Chiefs versus Dolphins. This is apparently going to be a freezer game. And honestly, it's probably going to be... Okay, Elden Ring. All right, all right, you got it. I, I, because, I, because you know, sometimes people think that the, the boss before that is the final boss. So I, I just wanted to make sure. Um, so yes, you are on the final boss if that gives you any solace. Um, also, my one tip, I know I said I wasn't gonna talk about any more Elden Ring. My one tip is to not summon your mimic until the second phase <laughs> uh cheese versus dolphins it's going to be a cold game uh the dolphins have not had a good record against teams who are above 500 and what do you know the chiefs are above 500 even though the chiefs are limping into the playoffs at this point um it does also it also feels like the dolphins are limping into the playoffs even though they are uh, quite literally the probably the least um banged up team next to the cowboys in the playoffs right now um, they still have most of their weapons, and, and even the ones that they did lose are coming back. And maybe they're not going to be at 100%. Who knows? But they still got, um, yeah, they still got uh, Tyreek Hill in there. They got Devin A. Chan. Um, they got uh, Tua when he's playing well. He's 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 good for the team. But my number one reason for not picking the Dolphins in this game: one, it's a cold game in Arrowhead. Uh, and two, the Dolphins haven't really won against a good team this year. They didn't even beat the Bills who have been struggling this year and kind of also limped into the playoffs. Um, so that's why I, I chose the Chiefs this week. I, I, I feel like the, the Dolphins are just going to be another one-and-out team just like they were last year. Last year, though, it made sense because they were so banged up. They did not have any of their starting players, I think, except for Tyreek Hill. Because uh, they had they had like the uh, like a rookie or whatever in. Um, it's just one of those things. It's like, oh, man, the, Dol like, the Dolphins this year should have been so much better and should have proven that they were better than a lot of these teams, but they still fell flat in the places that they really needed to prove themselves. And I don't think they're going to beat the Chiefs, especially in Arrowhead, especially in the cold temperatures. This is kind of where Patrick Mahomes thrives, but it also may be his demise. We'll see. But the Chiefs, I, I feel like, are going to win out here. Uh, Steelers versus Bills. The Steelers, let's be honest, didn't deserve to make the playoffs. Okay. It, it, it did. They didn't deserve to make the playoffs. The Jaguars should have been in their spot, and I still would have said that the Bills are going to win this game uh, because the Jaguars weren't good. <laughs> but the Steelers are also not that good either. Um, even though they've won a couple games in a row in stunning fashion, um, the only reason that they have been playing hard this past few weeks is to just give themselves a winning record to keep Mike Tomlin's streak alive, uh, which is, you know, kind of just how it kind of goes, right? Um and apparently they're also supposed to be snowed out there as well. Greedy Waffles is saying that the game is supposed to, or is possibly going to be moved to Cleveland, which could be kind of interesting. Um, neutral field. Well, I guess really not neutral. You could have people from Buffalo or Pittsburgh come to the game. So maybe not even a neutral. Maybe it could be a pretty divided field if they do move to Cleveland. That doesn't change my pick, though. Um, I think the Bills strive in in inclement, inclement weather, even though, of course, they didn't win last year against the Bengals when it counted, I do think that the Bills are definitely going to be able to best the moribund Steelers. Um, the Steelers lost TJ Watt? JJ Watt? Is it, it's JJ Watt, right? They lost Watt. Whatever Watt they have, they lost. Um, and that is a huge L for the team. Also, they have Mason Rudolph starting... And, um, fuck Mason Rudolph. I'll just say that. Uh, but the team has been playing relatively well, I guess, with Najee Harris actually showing what he's worth. He was, like, drafted number 10 overall in the draft a few years ago. So it's like, okay, he's finally showing some stuff. But I do think the Bills are going to take the win here. Hopefully the weather is not so bad that it really reduces this game to the, like, you know, running <laughs> and whatever. But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the NFC, uh, we have the Eagles and the Bucks. Um, I, I, I really, uh, I really think that this is a closer game than people realize. Um, I don't, I don't think, 
I don't think anyone locked up... Oh, well, Coco locked up the Eagles. I don't think that anyone should lock up the Eagles, in my opinion, in this game. Because the Eagles... They are on a losing streak. They lost five out of six games the past six games here, which is pretty crazy. They just capped off that losing streak against the Giants of all teams. They lost against Tyrod Taylor and the Giants. They lost A.J. Brown, possibly, for this game. Um, Jalen Hurts hurt his finger. His, uh, I think it's his middle finger on his throwing hand. Um, the team has just not been looking good on defense either because, let's be honest, Matt Patricia. Who knows why they hired that man, but he has sunk three or four teams now, including the second his second run with the Patriots. So, you know, he has a really bad streak. I don't know why the Eagles would have hired him. He, that was an L hire from the beginning. I really honestly debated picking the Buccaneers here, but I did end up going with the Eagles because the Bucks, for what it's worth, uh, they only kicked field goals against the Panthers, who are the joke team of the of the year, <laughs> essentially. Um, they had the worst record, and they don't even get the first round pick that they have because they gave it to the Bears uh, last year. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the Eagles will still win here. I think so. I think the Eagles still will win. Um, but I think it's going to be a closer game than you think. I think the, it's going to be a closer game than you think. And I uh, I do think that this could be the upset of the week. It doesn't matter because the, you know, the next team that either of these teams face will be the 49ers. So, whatever. Uh, the Raven... Oh, I'm sorry, the Ravens are on by. The Rams versus the Lions. This is also... I think this is also going to be another really close game. Uh, this is a revenge game, quote-unquote, for uh, Jeff... For Jared Goff. <laughs> Forgot his name there. And um, the Lions have been a bit wishy-washy, both on defense and, and offensively. Am I rooting for the Lions? Yes. I root for Dan Campbell. I root for Amon Ross St. Brown. Um, I root for Jared Goff, I guess. And I root for David Montgomery. Um, but I think the Rams have a better team right now. I think the Lions are going to be one and done, even though it's a, it's a historic, you know, first time that they've... I think this is like the first time since the 90s that they've won their division. It's historic, but I don't think they're actually going to get farther than this game. Um, I think the Rams, in general, have a more electric team. Um, not only do they have Matthew Stafford, who this is also a revenge game for him, don't forget, uh, but they also have the rookie sensation, my guy of the year, folks, the official Yemi's guy of the year, Puka Nakua, who was a phenomenal wide receiver, can catch balls like no other and run with it. Um, and they also have Cooper Cuppin. He's healthy. He's a beast. He's crazy. Also, the the rookie running back, I think his, his last name is Williams, amazing as well. Uh, and they also have a pretty sturdy defense for what it's worth. Uh, they haven't been playing as good as I thought they would, but they still have a very strong defense. I think this is going to be a shootout, honestly. Um, but I think in the end, the Rams are going to get the upper edge, um, which will give them some false hope for repeat Super Bowl appearances. But, uh, yeah, I think the Rams are going to get the win here over the Lions. I just, I have a feeling in my gut. I have a feeling in my gut. Puka Nakua, it's, uh, let me spell it for you here. Let me, let me spell it for you real quick. Puka, P-U-K-A-N-U-C-A? Or am I, I think I might be doing that backwards. Puka N I think I think I think I got the K and the C mixed. I think it's I think it's like that. Or it could be two C's. I could be wrong about that. Uh, fantasy ended quite a while for me, so I haven't really looked at my team at all. <laughs> uh, next up, we have the Packers versus the Cowboys. Is ninety two Oso still here? Is is ninety two Oso still here? I, I calling ninety two Oso. Ninety two Oso, are you here? If he's not here, I'll just continue. Packers versus Cowboys. Packers. Night also, do you want to uh, quickly come on and give your thoughts about this game? If you do, join the cafe waiting room in the Discord. Um, 
because I would love to talk to you about this. Uh, I, uh, I want to hear your thoughts as a Packers fan. And if you don't want to come on, that's fine. If you just want to type up something in chat, I would appreciate that too. Um, because, oh, you're driving. Okay, <laughs> never mind. Don't type or anything if you don't feel comfortable. Um, this is a, an unfortunate matchup for the Packers. Now, this could also be a good matchup for the Packers because historically, the Cowboys have kind of been a bit flat in the playoffs, right? But the Cowboys have been a bit of a juggernaut this year. And even though they've won some weird, uh, some, some weird games... They've lost some weird games. Unfortunately, I'm picking the Cowboys here. And I apologize for picking the Bears last week. But the Cowboys are at home. They uh, they rested their players. Or maybe they didn't. They didn't rest their players this past week. They beat up on the Commanders. And they looked good doing it. Um, 92 also says, Pack L. Happy with the run, though. Packers made history. Right. I think that any Packers fan should be happy with this season. They showed that Jordan Love was progressing in a positive direction. He had some rough games in there. But, you know, he's still pretty young, all things considered. I think that I think that next year is probably going to be the Packers year. I, I That's what I'm guessing. Because they have the building blocks for what they need. I don't think that they're there yet to beat the Cowboys. Even if the Cowboys do somehow like miss all their field goals again this year <laughs> uh so unfortunately i do I, I am picking the cowboys here but i have a very strong feeling that it's going to be a close game um or it could be a blowout and that would be unfortunate but that's the wild card weekend friends now now things get a little bit tricky because who knows what's actually going to happen in the wild card weekend we could have some really weird un uh, upsets you know 92 also also says the Packers are the youngest playoff team since 1970s, which is also a pretty cool stat there as well. So I have the Browns beating the Texans, and we have to go to the Ravens uh, in Baltimore to uh, try and get a win over them after we hopefully beat the Texans. And even though we did split a win and a loss with the Ravens in the in the regular season, um, the first loss was a bit fluky because we had. Don, uh, DTR in um, and the team just was not great with him at the helm at that point um, the second win was a pretty good win but I we had Deshaun Watson at that time <laughs> so even though I think that the Browns have a very interesting team right now they are my team they're my boys I feel feel like the Ravens are going to beat us up and that's um, that's my prediction now I know that the Ravens also historically have fallen flat in the playoffs just think about that year that they had the bye Lamar Jackson won MVP and they lost against the Titans in a big loss um, it wasn't like super big but it was like a very very interesting game <laughs> that could happen again because Lamar Jackson and the and OBJ and Zay Flowers and Gus Edwards and all of them were not playing in Week 18, and when the Ravens lost, it was because they rested their players for too long. They got out of practice, I guess you could say. They just got maybe a bit too complacent. Now I will predict the Ravens to win this game. But keep in mind that historically, which means the past like five years, the Ravens have kind of fallen flat in the playoffs after having the bye week. So keep that in mind. I do think the Ravens have a great team right now. They have a well-built team. They have some young players. They have some older players. Lamar Jackson can finally throw the ball to some people. They're still missing their amazing tight end. Um, so that is a bit of a loss. Uh, he's he's out for the rest of the year. Um, but, I mean, they've had good replacements. They've had people step up in those roles. Um, even D D Clowney, who used to be a Browns player, has been playing pretty good. He got like a $75,000 uh, paycheck or $750,000 paycheck uh, for his tackles in the game against um, the Steelers, I think. So there you go. Um 
I think the Ravens will beat the Browns in the next in 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 the in the uh, divisional round there. And on the other on the other hand, we have the Bills versus the Chiefs, which is a bit of a rivalry, I guess you could say. Um, that these teams are kind of split in terms of win losses against each other. Uh, if I was a betting man, I would put my money down on the Bills to win that game, but the Chiefs. <laughs> They, uh, they got the refs in their pocket, maybe not as much as they used to, but they still have that power of the ref, as I've talked about in previous episodes of this very podcast. And even though the refs got the right call and in, and in turn screwed them in that one game, we there's a historic tale as a, a very long scroll of all of all the deeds that the refs have done for the Chiefs, giving them extra downs, giving them free late hits, Giving them uh, uh, touch, to, you know, just just all these different calls that went their way. I think the Bills are the upset team of this year. They did not play great in the regular season, but they won when it counted. And I think that the Bills will overtake the Chiefs here and lead themselves to the uh, the AFC Championship against the Ravens. So I think the the Bills will beat out the Chiefs. Patrick Holmes will go home crying and screaming and, and whatever, and all will be right with the world. On the other end, the NFC, Eagles going against the 49ers, or Buccaneers going against the 49ers. It's a coin flip game, in my opinion, at this point. Uh, but I, I did predict the Eagles. I think the Eagles will lose in stunning fashion against the 49ers. The 49ers are known for beating down on the weaker teams. They already had their slump during the middle of the year. Uh, I'm sorry, the season. Um, it started with the Browns game, and it ended with, like, the Commanders game or something like that. Um, so the 49ers, they're back in action. They have all their best players. Brandon Ayuk, uh, Christian McCaffrey, um, George Kittle, Brock Purdy, all playing at the best that they can. Um, the only problem is is that they've had a historic run with injuries uh, and quarterbacks. Uh, last year, that was their main downfall, was their quarterbacks just got so beat up and hurt that they could not do anything against the Cowboys, uh, not the Cowboys, um, against the Eagles. Uh, everyone predicted that the 49ers would beat the Eagles in that game, but because the 49ers were so beat up after the Cowboys game, uh, that was it. That was the last straw. But the 49ers have a much stronger team this year, which is crazy to think about. Their defense is stacked with both Chase Young and um, fucking what's-his-face. <laughs> I can't remember his name right now. It's escaping my mind. Um, so I do think that the 49ers will either get an easy win over the Eagles or the Buccaneers, whichever team makes it. Um, because, one, the Buccaneers, they were the winners of tank division, and they kind of suck, but they still did enough to get into the playoffs, okay? The Eagles started off strong, but something happened, and they lost their defense, and they're losing players left and right. They probably shouldn't even have their starters playing against the Giants because they were already in the playoffs last week. But hopefully A.J. Brown is okay. He's my guy for a few years now in, in fantasy football, and I do like Jalen Hurts. Hopefully he's going to be fine with that finger injury. I guess only time will tell. But I do think that the 49ers will beat the snot out of either the Eagles or the Buccaneers, whoever gets there in the end. And on the other side here, uh, we have the Rams versus the Cowboys. And I do think that kind of the same thing as the 49ers. I think the Cowboys will beat the piss out of either the Lions or the Rams. Um, and the Cowboys will continue on to the NFC Championship. I'm going to go a little bit more quickly because I'm getting tired uh, the AFC Championship Ravens versus Bills. It's probably going to be a pretty close contest, but I think the Ravens will win out uh, against the Bills. Uh, the Bills just uh, Josh Allen is known for throwing an interception at the worst times, whether it be in uh, red zone interceptions or or whatnot. Um, I think that that will come back to haunt them in this game, unless something crazy happens and the Ravens lose like Lamar or one of their best wide receivers like Zay Flowers. I think that the Ravens will have a good a, de a good game against the Bills, and I think it'll still be a good, de a decent affair. I think the Ravens will come out on top, and in the NFC, the 49ers versus the Cowboys. Once again, it's just the, it's just history, folks. The 49ers have kind of owned the Cowboys multiple times, and I think that the 49ers have a better team than the Cowboys right now. Even the Cowboys, they do have a great team, don't get me wrong, 
Uh, but every single year, the Cowboys kind of prove that they're not that guy. And uh, the 49ers, I think, will beat the Cowboys in the NFC Championship. Meaning that the Ravens and the 49ers will be in the Super Bowl is my prediction, which I'm sure is a lot of people's predictions. Uh, usually the first round buy teams are the favorites, the heavy favorites. And in this case, I think that both buy teams will make it to the end. Simply just, it's just facts, bros. It's just facts. Uh, I mean, look at, I mean, right now, if I pit the Ravens against the Browns or the Texans, I think the Ravens win. If I pit the Ravens against the Chiefs or the Bills, I think the Ravens win. If I pit the Ravens against the Texans somehow, I think the Ravens win. If I pit the, the Ravens against the Steelers or the Dolphins, the Ravens win. That, that is just facts right there, folks. I think the Ravens, they, they don't have as many injuries as the rest of the league. I think they're playing lights out right now. And I just think that the Browns, the Texans, the Chiefs, the Dolphins, the Steelers, and the Bills all just do not have the gusto right now to get into the Super Bowl. And I think that's just a, just a problem for the NFL in general this year, which is too many injuries. Too many injuries, folks. But if somehow the Bills do make it in, I would appreciate that. I think the Bills, um, they deserve a Super Bowl win after losing three in a row back in the day. Um, in terms of uh, 49ers getting here, um, I think the 49ers could easily beat the Bucks or the Eagles. I think they could beat the Rams. They could beat the Lions. They could beat the Packers. The only team with a question mark is the Cowboys, which will be, I th I'm predicting, will be the NFC Championship. So the Ravens and the, and the 49ers in the Super Bowl, and uh, I don't really have a prediction for this one. I just kind of put them there and said, well, that's my prediction for the Super Bowl, but I really don't, I don't really don't know who could possibly win this one. It really does, it does, it, it will matter to see who, who gets injured. You know, there, there's probably going to be a big time injury somewhere along this line. Um, I think in the end, I think the 49ers have a stronger team all around, but the, the Ravens are frisky. And Lamar is going to be hungry for that trophy, okay? He's been in the league long enough. He's been MVP. He's probably going to get MVP again. Um, I think that the Ravens are going to be more hungry for the Super Bowl trophy. Uh, they'll, hoist, they'll, hoist, they'll hoist the Lombardi uh, for the first time since like 2000-something. Uh, the 49ers, on the other hand, they were there a couple of years ago. Actually, a few years in a row, they were right there on the door of the Super Bowl or at the Super Bowl. And they could not get it done with Jimmy Garoppolo. Now we have Brock Purdy, who is the unsung hero of the NFL right now. He is Mr. Mr. Um, not unlimited. He's 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 Mr. Uh, unknown. He, he is Mr. Irrelevant because he was the last player selected in the draft of that year. And he's proven himself to maybe maybe he is a system quarterback. Maybe maybe that's maybe fuck me. Maybe he is. A, uh, doesn't matter. The system's good. The coaching is good. The players are good, and I think on paper, the Ravens have the hunger, but the 49ers have the team that I think can beat the Ravens. Uh, so we will see what happens in the end, but that is just my prediction. It's just a theory, a uh, NFL sports theory. Hey, rest in peace, Matt Pat's YouTube career, huh? All right, that is it, folks. I've gone longer than usual. For good reason. We had a lot of great conversation today. The what if segment went a little bit longer than I was expecting, so I do apologize about that. But it was all, I, I hope that it was all fun. I hope it was all good. It's going to be a very interesting end of the year here. And I, I maybe mean, not end of the year, end of the season for the NFL here. So I, I do think that um, there might be a couple upsets that we're not expecting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but I, yeah, I think in general, we had a nice podcast here today, folks. Talked about What If Season 2, shitted on it a lot. Uh, we talked about Deftones the, on all their albums. I really had a fun time with Callus on that. Thank you again to him. And also, the NFL talk was great. Um, I do, I, I, you know, I wish that Night Two Oso wasn't driving right now because I really wanted to hear his sultry and sweet voice. Speaking of NFL fans... Nomad Eric with the raid. Thank you so much for the raid here, buddy. <laughs> oui, oui. Hey, Nomad, I have a split second decision. Do you want to come on the podcast and talk about the commanders and your and your thoughts and hopes and prayers for your future? It doesn't have to be anything long. If you got a minute, I would love to have you on. Uh, the cafe waiting room in my Discord is the place to go, and I can move you over. Do you want to do that? 
And if you don't, no problem, no sweat. I understand. I'm kind, I'm kind of tired myself. It's pretty late. I usually, I'm already kind of in bed <laughs> uh, at this time. Ooh, Nomad said he'd rather slam his head into a revolving door, but he would join for a quick second. Now that is the kind of the kind of monster we need, folks. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we have the, I have the cafe waiting room, which is under the Twitch tab. Let's go in my Discord. If you join that, I can move you over into my my abode. Uh, here we go. Nomad, are you there? Nomad, hello, Nomad. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> I, it, listen, it's been a long day. It's it can, long day. It might as well be morning at this point. Um, Nomad, thank you for the raid, by the way. I really do appreciate that. Yeah, how, no how, how was your stream? What were you doing? Uh, it was pretty good. We were just exploring Night City and Cyberpunk, which I'm I'm actually I'm loving more and more the more I play. Have you met Judy um, yet? Yes, I've met her once. Ju Judy's my bae. I love Judy. I, I, I've, I'm still kind of like getting acclimated to some of the characters, but it's it's pretty interesting. You know me. I do all the side stuff as well, so I haven't gotten super deep into the main quest. Um, but you know, it's it's been a lot of fun so far. I've actually I'm I was. I was worried about like, cause you know I heard all the rumors that Night City was kind of empty. Whatever the game was when it first came out, it is definitely not like that anymore. I'm loving it. It's actually a full city. I'm I'm having a lot of fun. I, even even when I played it before this big update, it was still pretty like dense. It was pretty good. So, um, I think that was a problem with the early build. Mm -hmm. You know, they. It's one of those games that's like, if we just gave it another year to cook, this would have been like one of the greatest games of all time. It's it's still really good. Don't get me wrong, but the uh, first impressions for a lot of people is the reason why it's so negative, and people will not give it another chance. And I do think that this game, I think Cyberpunk deserves another chance. I agree. I actually really do agree. And that, I mean, again, you know, I I kind of got lucky that I waited so long to play it because of the early reviews. Um, but they they fixed it, so. Two thumbs up for me so far. <laughs> we'll see if it stays that way. But so far, early game, two thumbs up. I'm really having fun. Well, you know who didn't... the Your, your commanders didn't feel like deserved a second chance? Oh, Riverboat Ron. Um, well, no. he, he had four, so... <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, he had four. But he didn't get a fifth chance. <laughs> he now, uh, Nomad, if you don't know, Nomad is a, is a, is a fan of the commanders... Um, big fan, big, big, big fan. Um, and things have not gone as well as maybe he's hoped these past couple years. Um, what are your hopes and who do you think is going to be hired for your team? Well, really, I haven't had a good 20 years, but you know, who's counting? Um, no, I honestly, at this point, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm kind of on the mindset of I'm not going to get hype until we start to win or I see things trending in a positive direction. But for me, this year was never gonna be a successful year because this year was nothing more than holdover from Dan Snyder. You know, Harris bought the team later than he wanted to, later than we wanted him to. So he didn't have a chance. I, I really do feel if Harris bought the team when he first tried, uh, before Dan Snyder tried to bait his offer to get a higher offer, I think Ron Rivera is fired last year. And Ron Rivera is not our coach this year. But because mm. Dan Snyder drugged that, oh, I got a $7 billion offer, $7 billion. Who's got $8 billion? Who's got $8 billion? No one? I guess I'll take the $7 billion three months after he offered it. And now Harris is stuck with what the team is. So I feel like things would have been a lot different had Dan sold it originally. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. You know, he's he sold it now. Harris has it. And uh, as long as we don't hire Bill Belichick, I am completely okay with whatever coach we go with. <laughs> and that's no that's no shade to Bill. Bill's the goat, he, you know. And I someone's gonna get him, and I really do think he's got a few more years left in him. I just think he got saddled with a bad QB in New England, and Robert Kraft wouldn't let him draft another one. Uh, he can turn a defense around. That I mean, even the, the the Patriots still had a good defense this year. Um, but I just want us to go with a young coach that we can. I I I want a Mike Tomlin a John Harbaugh, a, a Bill Belichick, a coach for 20 years, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's what I would love for us to get. Not a not, not a five-year carousel, you know? Yeah, you know, I hear Matt Patricia's got a job opening coming up here um, if he loses you in this uh, wild that, card round. You remember that uh, that slamming my head in a revolving door thing I said earlier? Yeah, that, <laughs> that one. 
Yeah, no, if if we hire Matt Patricia like legit now, legit, no, I won't be a commander fan anymore. Let, let <laughs> me ask you, let me ask you. Mike Vrabel, does that sound like a good hire for you? He would if if there weren't better options available. Um I would rather go with one of the coordinators that hasn't been fired. Uh personally. Uh Ben Johnson is a big one for me. Uh, they're, they're, uh, shit, let's, Antonio Pierce would be a great one for me, honestly. Uh, although I don't think the Raiders are going to let him go. Um, but, uh, there was, there was someone else that someone was talking about. Um, I can't remember who, I think he was, uh, oh, Ben McDonald, the Ravens defensive coordinator. Oh yeah. That's another one that I've seen a lot of people wanting us to interview. Um, so I would much rather go with one of them that are finding success right now. Uh, ben, uh, ben Johnson, I think is his name, is um, uh, the Detroit Lions OC. And then McDonald is Ravens DC. Those are two excellent units. And if you really want to be honest, Detroit doesn't have a great quarterback. No offense to Jared Goff, he's okay. But I wouldn't call Jared Goff a top 10 quarterback. <laughs> and yet that offense is chugging like it is one. So, I mean, that that's that's coaching for me, which means, you know, if, if he had Sam Howell, maybe that's, you know, someone he could work with. But, I mean, I know we're taking Caleb Williams with the number two pick. So, whoever we get, I just want it to be someone that can work with a young quarterback. Now, Greedy Waffles threw out the uh, Eric Bieniemy coaching prospect. I know you have some strong opinions about that. For me, with Eric Bieniemy, it... I, it's it's so hard to truly analyze both Eric Bieniemy's offense and Sam Howell with the horrible team we have overall. Uh, offensive line played like crap the first half of the season, and then by the time the offensive line finally started playing better in the second half, Sam Howell got the heck beat out of him. Now he's gun shy. Now he's skittish. You got the defense giving up 38 points a game, so Sam Howell thinks he's got to score 40, so he's making throws that he probably shouldn't make, and they're getting picked. I, I don't know if you can truly judge them off of one season, uh, either one of them, but we don't get the number two pick very often, but we still got the number two pick with him being the coach. And again, Josh Harris didn't really pick him. That was Ron Rivera's pick, and now Ron's gone. So I can truly see Josh Harris going with a clean house system. If he decides to keep Eric Bieniemy as an offensive coordinator, I'm okay with that. I do not think he's earned a head coach spot yet, though. Um, but if we want to keep him for OC one more year, I'm fine with it. See what he can do with the with a good draft and a better head coach on top of him. I don't think he deserves the head coach spot, though. What is the worst case scenario besides from resurrecting Adolf Hitler to coach the Commanders? Okay, what would be the worst case scenario for the team right now if uh, for coaches? Well, Matt Patricia is a really good one since you <laughs> mentioned him. Um, well, that's that's the know, same as resurrecting Adolf Hitler, though. Like, yeah, gonna... that's true. Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, Arthur Smith would be a good one. That would be that would be a good worst case scenario. Although, quite frankly, I think he should be jettisoned into the sun for what he did to be John Robinson in my fantasy team last year. <laughs> um, but I, I, man, I hate to say it, but out of the the most realistic worst case scenario would probably be hiring bill belichick mm. i think that would be like like obviously we, we, we can pull crazy scenarios but outside of the most realistic scenarios coaches that want to coach still that are probably going to get a head coaching job somewhere i think our worst case scenario is bill belichick just because i don't think he's got enough years left and i don't know if he can work with a young quarterback I think he needs a veteran quarterback. Yeah, he needs Tom Brady back from retirement. Okay, okay, hold on. Scenario time. Bill mm -hmm. Belichick, coach of the Commanders, mm -hmm. brings Tom Brady back from retirement again for a second time. So we're going to get a 100-year coach and a 90-year-old quarterback is what you're saying. Effectively, in football but years. Tom Brady's going to play tight end, though. He'll shatter his kneecaps on like the fourth snap. It's <laughs> the man's old. The man's older than I am. <laughs> My knees don't work right, and I didn't run on them for twenty years. 
<laughs> well, hey, uh, Nomad, I, once again, I appreciate your raid. We're wrapping up here. Uh, I appreciate your raid. I appreciate you coming on for a couple you know minutes here and talking to me. I, very enjoyable always to have you um, chatting. I, I think you're a very knowledgeable guy. You're a very genuine guy, and you're a very lovable guy, um, which is why... Uh, which is why I love you. It's, uh, uh, you know, uh, I just want to say that. Well, thank you so much. I love you too, Yemi. You're always, a, you're all, you're always a saint, and I love talking to you as well. Thank you so much. Nomad, have a nice sleep. <laughs> have, yeah. have, have a nice sleep. Um, yes, and have my a good, friends. have a good, have a good Friday too, because uh, it is. Yeah, it's, it's my third day of work tomorrow. Oh it's yes, congratulations yeah. on the job. Yeah, I hope that's going well. It has been, yeah. It's it's a lot to learn, you know. Service writing and stuff like that is new, especially with the construction equipment. But, you know, I'm, I'm I feel like I'm getting it pretty quickly. It's just you know a lot of information, and I'm completely foreign with it when it comes to like bobcats and stuff like that. So, a lot of information to learn. Still struggling to maintain all of it, but I'll get it eventually. <laughs> I have the utmost faith in you. I think that when you you're the kind of guy who when you put your mind to uh, to something, you you get it done. You you learn it and you get it done. Absolutely. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick you. No offense, I'm gonna kick you from the. Um, from I'm the a cop anyway. <laughs> but, uh, have, have a good, good night. night. Thank you again. Bye. All right, that was Nomad Eric, folks. Nomad Eric, friend of the channel. Definitely check him out on Twitch if you haven't yet. Um, I I I'm 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 pretty tired at this point. I'm not as tired as I was at the end of last episode. I will say that. Okay. At least I'm making coherent sen sentences at this point <laughs> uh, but my brain did kind of stop working midway through the playoff section so um we will be back folks with the ferret cafe podcast in two weeks okay. um, so today's the 11th so we won't be doing another one until the 25th uh, i don't really have a plan yet for the next episode but i think that we're going to be doing something maybe history related i was thinking of maybe going through uh going through the uh the tale of pompeii if that sounds kind of interesting to y'all it kind of sounds interesting to me it's something that i really haven't really thought about since uh, back in the school days so there you go um so usually the first topic is like the short one um and then the second and third topic uh are the longer ones um so maybe we'll just do two next week but Last week, uh, I ended the podcast about 15 minutes early, so we're just we're just making up for lost time, really, at this point. Um, I do appreciate everyone for sticking around and, and chatting and stuff like that. Um, extra thank you again to Nomad for the raid. Also, thank you to everyone who's been in the chat and kind of either lurking or chatting. Always appreciate that. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your night and have a nice Friday. Uh, Saturday, don't forget... Saturday is the top 10 video games. Um, I know this is going to be old news by the time that this episode comes up, but Saturday the 13th is the top 10 video games of 2023. It's about an hour long video, so we're going to be doing a live reaction to that and then playing Power Wash Simulator afterwards. Um, if you're part of the contest, um, there you cannot change your top 10 list anymore i've saved all the top 10 lists uh, and you cannot change of course your game of the year guests uh, so good luck to whoever uh, is in that as well if you want to check out the other podcasts i do fair what? 64 is the video game podcast uh, where i talk about video game news and occurrences we just had the third annual ferret awards it was a rousing success i appreciate everyone who helped out with that um and i thought that it just turned out so great uh, I was yeah! just so, so happy with how that ended up. I was I was just so happy, uh, and I appreciate everyone who helped out with that. Um, and then also, I do Film Freaks with a Z. There's a new episode coming out tomorrow at the time of the, the, the live broadcast here where we talk about the movie Stranger Than Fiction starring Will Ferrell. <laughs> uh, so if you want to check that out, that'll be available tomorrow. Also, the fan vote happens tomorrow as well in the Discord, so make sure that you put your votes in for that if you so desire. Actually, not even if you desire. Just do it anyway. I don't... You know, I, I, fuck it. I don't care if you don't want to. Do it. Let's choose our fate. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening to this episode of Ferret Cafe. I will see you all in about two weeks. Uh, the up, the re-upload of this VOD is up on the next Thursday, uh, but the audio version will be available Do it. either the next day or the day after that. Uh, just depends on when I get it all good and going. I might actually wait to upload the audio version of this one just because 
I have Film Freaks coming out and Fair 64 will still be coming out this weekend, even though the top 10 list is coming out too. Uh, so I might wait until next Thursday to do the audio version as well this week uh, because I just have a packed schedule. Um, so yeah, once again, I'm here with the Ferret. This has been Ferret Cafe. I appreciate you all. Have a good night and have a good Friday. I will see you all on Saturday Bye, or bitch. next time in about two weeks for the next episode. Um, I'll talk at you then. Good night and goodbye. Yeah,